Hi everyone, um, my name is Martin and I'm the chapter leader for OWASP Santa Barbara. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our March event, which is uh, the first one that we're doing online. We have uh, more than 100 people signed up for this event and I think we have yeah, more than 50 already on. So I want to thank everyone um, for taking the time to join us today. Um, a quick note on online events, um, people who know me well, they know that I usually, I try not to do, to do too many things online when I have the chance to do them in person. And that's why I was Santa Barbara, it's been mainly um, meeting in person at different locations here in Santa Barbara and not really opening those events to be joined remotely. Um, one of the main reasons for that is that um, I really like getting people together face to face to you know have discussions and learn with each other um, hand by hand um, in the same room. This way um, we can grow the local community, and that's hard to a little bit harder to do if you open it and online. Now, given the circumstances, um, obviously online is the the way to go, and it's going to be it seems for a little while. So I'm still really happy to do this event with Mike um, and actually have um, such a big turnout where people keep joining. So I'm really happy to see that. Today, um, we're doing a workshop on Wireshark for incident response and threat hunting. Um, Mike Wiley is uh, presenting this workshop and Mike is um, the director of cybersecurity services at Richie May and also a really good friend of mine. Uh, thank you, Mike, for taking the time to do this training for us. Um, I'll, let, um, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, I don't even know what day it is anymore with this quarantine. It could be a Saturday. So thanks for joining us, whatever day of the week it is. A um, couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you have not already joined the uh, the OWASP chapter Santa Barbara Slack channel, please do that now. We're gonna do all questions, comments, concerns, technical issues through Slack. We've got Martin and Joseph, who's on my team at Richie May, monitoring the Slack channel and they will rudely interrupt me if uh, we've got problems, um, especially with this many people in attendance. I wanna make sure that everyone's in that channel and able to essentially raise their hand or pose a question and so I can slow down if there's problems since we're not face to face. Um, if you haven't by now, uh, install Wireshark on the machine you'll be using for the workshop. I've also provided a virtual machine that I believe was in the uh, initial details of the webinar. It's a Kali Linux system. Uh, the username is root, password is Tor. And um, I've got a couple other links there in S3 buckets for you to download the lab PCAPs, the Geo IP database, and Wireshark profiles. There's also a link to the slide. So if you wanna follow along or do some of the labs, which I'm sure we won't have time for, then you can take a look at that. And then always uh, connect on Twitter, LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to get hold of me after this if you have any questions, comments, concern, or just want to chat. Um, I think I also posted that in the Slack channel. I'm gonna, from time to time, I'll look at the Slack channel, but really that's where Martin's gonna come in and Joseph, they're gonna interrupt me if you have questions. Um, and they'll try and answer anything they can in the Slack channel. So let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, as Martin mentioned, I am the Director of Cybersecurity Services at Richie Bay Technology Solutions. Um, we do a lot of different cybersecurity related services at Richie Bay Technology Solutions. We do incident response, penetration testing. Um, we do a lot of audits and uh, architecture. So we've got a pretty big team of people with a lot of different diverse backgrounds. Um, even though I am the director, one of my favorite things to do is um, get really technical, look at packets, look at malware, um, anything that's really geeky and technical, I, I dig. Uh, just quick background on us, we've got within the technology practice, practice at Richie May Technology Solutions, we've got cybersecurity, which is my core group that I work with, and Joseph, who's um, moderating this, uh, the Slack channel as well. We've got cloud service team, we have a GRC team, business intelligence, uh, content security, which I also lead here in Los Angeles. So I help studios and vendors uh, basically protect all the movies and make sure they don't get on Pirate Bay. And then we also have a technology management consulting practice as well. Okay, a couple of legal disclaimers before we get started here. Um, 
I am not an attorney. I just pretend to be one. So make sure you know the laws and don't just take my word for it. But in California, um, it is a two-party consent state. So you may be joining us from who knows where, but at least in California, if you're local, um, essentially, if we're on a phone call here, I have to have your consent and my consent to record the conversation. And I bring that up because there has been cases, uh, one notably with Google, where they were driving around with the Google street cars and they were collecting SSID information. But if it was not encrypted, they were also sniffing traffic and they went to court, they lost, they went to an appellate court, they won. So it's kind of a 50, 50, whether you are or are not wiretapping if you, do any type of packet capture. So uh, I would just recommend make sure you have written authorization from those who can give you authorization and don't just go run Wireshark at Starbucks. Um, let me minimize this because I have way too many windows here. I'm looking at myself instead of the slides, much better. Okay, and um, so as I mentioned, just make sure you know the laws. I put some penal codes up there as well. Um, another piece, uh, Wireshark may be subject to U.S. export regulations. That is on the Wireshark website. Um, so if you are taking Wireshark or you're installing it on a laptop and you take it outside the U.S., um, just think about that twice. I know certain countries like Germany are really, really strict with their um, penetration testing or hacking tools. So you just don't want to walk around other countries with, uh, with Wireshark or any of the tools we'll talk about here. Again, consult with an attorney. Um, and then any information that we're going to provide in this course, it's for educational purposes. Uh, this is a workshop that I do for some organizations and some um, security groups, and they generally charge for this anywhere from $150 to $1,000 for the workshop. Uh, because of COVID, I feel like we're all restless here getting cabin fever. And uh, I was talking to Martin, we said, you know what, let's just do something for free online. People can do it from their house and stay entertained rather than getting cabin fever. So uh, it's all educational. Uh, Richie Made Technology Solutions, myself, and OWASP Santa Barbara, or OWASP in general, is not responsible for any misuse of the information. Um, the PCAPs, I do want to mention about that. They are password protected. The password is infected, all lowercase. Um, I will give you in the labs some instructions on how to extract that. Um, you can skip ahead if you'd like. Uh, I do recommend on a Windows system to use 7-zip. It's a little bit easier for extracting um, anything from a password protected zip file. And if you are using Linux, unzip with a, the option of capital P, so TAC P, and then you put infected and that will um, help you out there. But again, I will give you some instructions how to do that in the labs. The PCAPs themselves are harmless. You can open them, double click on them. You're not gonna infect yourself. However, some of the PCAP files that we'll look at, it's essentially sniffing traffic in real time when I was installing malware, running malware, downloading malware. So in the clear text protocols that you have there, you can actually extract that binary outside of the network traffic, and then it becomes dangerous. So I just want to give you that risk that you do have to take a couple of steps to extract the malware, but inside those PCAPs are malware. So again, double clicking on them, you know, all kinds of messing with the PCAP files won't do too much. It's once you extract things out of it when it can get a little bit hairy. So if you are concerned, we did provide a Kali Linux VM for you to take a look at and play with, and it's a little bit more protected there. And um, so I just wanna make sure that everyone's aware of that. And if you uh, have any doubts, you can reach out in Slack and use the VM, but I just don't want anyone uh, contacting me after this saying that they extracted malware, infected their system, and there's a big incident we have to fix after this. Um, last pe piece of housekeeping, if you hear someone yelling in the background, do not get scared. It's just my one-year-old child who is hungry. Uh, he will be going to bed soon, so we should have some silence coming up. Um, some more legal stuff. Um, I just would say that you know, hackers, security experts aren't the only ones that are doing wiretapping. Um, if you know anything about Edward Snowden, and he, he talked about PRISM, which is essentially the NSA's wiretapping program. So even the NSA does it, big ISPs do it, it's all over the place. Um, so what exactly is a protocol analyzer? Um, which Wireshark is a protocol analyzer, but I want to break that down first. So it could be either hardware or software, captures um, and analyzes signals or data on a network. So when you go to google.com, when you go to Facebook, when you send an email, all that stuff has to go from your machine somewhere else and it's tra traversing the network. Um, and a protocol analyzer can take a look at that data. Um, most protocol analyzers, what they'll do to capture the network traffic is that they are going to put your network card into promiscuous mode. The way I like to give an analogy for this is, imagine you live in an apartment complex 
and you get mail every day, right? Just like network traffic. And the, you open your mailbox and you take a look at it. And most of the time the mail should be addressed to you. But occasionally you will find some mail from a prior tenant or someone who used to live there in the past. And what you're supposed to do if you're a good citizen is throw that mail away or return the sender, but you're not supposed to open it. If you are a, I don't want to say a bad person, but if you're not following the rules of society and you open their mail, that's not a good thing. It's breaking actually federal laws. Well, that's essentially the way that protocol analyzer work. It will put its network card into bad person mode and it will open mail or packets that are not meant for it. So it sniffs anything on the network and a traditional network card won't open things that's not meant for that network card or addressed to that network card, but it'll open up anything and everything that it can see within reach. Um, so these protocol analyzers, um, technically protocol analyzer is just looking at the the traffic that you've captured, but most uh, protocol analyzers today can also sniff that or collect that network data as well. So essentially getting the ones and the zeros off the wired ethernet cable you have or the wireless that you can't see in the air, and it's collecting that um, line by line in a tool like Wireshark, okay? Um, Wireshark's kind of the go-to tool because it can do a lot of stuff and it makes it easy looking at thousands and thousands of packets but it's not the only tool. There are def there's definitely a time and place for Wireshark. I'd say I use it 80% of the time. Situations where I'd use a different tool like TCP dump might be where I need to collect a lot of data. Wireshark is not good at collecting a lot of data. Once you get past about 10,000 packets, it generally crashes, doesn't respond, and you get kind of all kinds of problems there. So I generally use something like T-Shark or TCP dump when I want to collect a lot of network traffic, um, but it's really ugly to look at. It kind of looks like the matrix where it's just text flying across the screen. It's hard to scroll up and down. So I rather look at it in Wireshark, but collect it in a tool like TCP dump or T Shark. The other advantage of a CLI based tool is that you can script it. So you can deploy these tools to um, your entire environment. And then from there you can run commands and collect, let's say from all your endpoints. So let's look at some of the course objectives here. So learn how to collect network traffic, expand some of your Wireshark knowledge and skills, be able to configure custom Wireshark profiles for use cases. Um, be able to add GOIP information into Wireshark to gain some insight into where your traffic's coming from and going to. Quickly identify indicators of compromise, such as malicious traffic on your network, and my favorite part, hunt for malicious traffic. So let's take a look first at incident response versus threat hunting. So incident response, we're addressing and managing uh, post cybersecurity cases. So it could be many different events, not just the ones we see on the news, but it could be um, as simple as someone spilled coffee on the computer, but we're not really gonna use Wireshark for a coffee spill. We're gonna use it for something like malware being installed or a possible breach or uh, clear text traffic, passwords going across the network. There's certain cases where I'm gonna use something like Wireshark. But essentially we're trying to um, go through a process, and this describes it pretty well if you want a, a bedtime reading, but it goes through preparing, identifying incident, containing a threat, eradicating the threat, recovering business back to normal operations, and then finally figuring out the lessons you learned. And I think this is probably one of the most important parts is once you figure out the lessons learned, then you can do things to better pr protect your environment or defend your environment. So um, it frustrates me all the time when I have clients that say, cool, thank you for identifying that we have malware, we're going to go ahead and wipe the machine. And I, I wanna come back to them and just say, no, you're missing the point. The most critical part here is that you have now need to do research on this malware. You need to figure out how it got there because if it infected your endpoint, that means it bypassed your firewall, your email gateway, your IDS, your IPS, your you know, UTM, whatever tools you have there. And then your EDR, your antivirus, your host firewall. There's a bunch of layers that it got through to your endpoint and you need to fix some of these things. And so looking at, um, the network data can give us a lot of insight, even sometimes with encrypted data, we could take these indicators like IP addresses, uh, file names, URLs, domain names, and we can add those as blacklists um, to our uh, detective and preventive controls to better defend next time. Okay, and so threat hunting is a little bit different. I enjoy threat hunting a lot more because it doesn't involve being woken up at three in the morning. Uh, it's the, pro the process of proactively and iteratively searching through networks to detect and isolate advanced threats uh, that evade existing security solutions. So this is kind of going back to what I just talked about is if you've got ransomware, you have something that happened in your environment, it means your other controls were not effective. And so hunting lets you kind of look for those things, assuming that you've already been compromised and looking for certain indications and then trying to build your defense a little better, building a defensible architecture. 
Okay, so let's look at a couple scenarios and use cases. This is a new section since uh, I gave this talk at DEF CON last year, DEF CON 27. Um, so I had a lot of students that came up to me and said, well, this is awesome. This, I love the workshop, but how would I ever get these PCAPs that you gave me in the lab? You know, I'm, I'm not just going to sit there with Wireshark running 24-7, and they're absolutely right in most cases. So a couple situations where you can get these lab files, and yes, I staged all of these by infecting myself and downloading ransomware and stuff like that, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, in your environment, you can use a, a ton of different uh, solutions that are already in place or quickly spin something up. For example, um, you could have an IDS or IPS that alerts you and says, hey, you've got something malicious on your, on your network. And at that point, you pivot over to a system that is doing full packet capture. Um, I took a SANS course, uh, SEC 511, which was an awesome course, but one thing that I kind of complained about was that they were suggesting doing full packet capture at seven different points of every network. And I just thought the amount of data in most environments is just going to be astronomical and the cost will be too high, especially for retention of, of 365 dates. So one thing that I, I do think is if you don't have that kind of money or budget to capture full traffic for let's say a week or a month or a year, can you at least do it for 24 hours and be diligent about checking your IDS IPS alerts? fine tune those so that when you do get alert, it's something that you can actually act upon. And so if you have something that says, hey, you've got a new domain with a quad four IP address. So it's not google.com, it's 173.92.43.5. That's a little bit weird. You, uh, normal humans don't go to IP address URLs, they go to domain names. So things like that, that you can actually act upon, that would let you then pivot over to your 24 hour retention of PCAPs hunt or dig into that and try and find this the event that you're interested in so that's one option an nsm tool you can get security onion which doug berg over at security onions he basically took all these difficult tools put them together kind of like kali linux but for the blue team and you could just drop it in on spam port and you could collect uh collect data and it has bro snort Seracata, all kinds of stuff in there that's awesome um, you could do threat hunting. So you could just start sniffing randomly at different intervals of parts of your network looking for evil using some of these techniques. You could use bro, which is probably one of my favorite, or excuse me for everyone now that calls it Zeek. Um, we can run either a PCAP file that we have against bro, and I'll show you that in one of the labs, or you could have it running in real time on a span or a mirror port, and you can then generate logs and alerts based off of that. And so what bro or Zeek will do is it sits there rather than collecting all the traffic, which can be a lot, of, a lot of bandwidth. For example, at my house, I just upgraded to one gig by one gig circuit, and that's my house with only a couple people living here. Um, and businesses are getting more and more bandwidth. So it does become a challenge to collect full PCAP all the time. Um, but if you have Bro just sniffing it, but not writing it to disk, essentially, it's just looking at the traffic and then writing logs based off interesting things like binaries or HTTP traffic or... Uh, TLS certificates or weird, unusual things. It'll actually generate a log and I'll show you that here in, in a second. You could also trigger your SIM to identify certain things and pivot back over to PCAP. You could have endpoint detection response like a Silence or Ray Canary, Carbon Black, CrowdStrike, et cetera. Or you might be able to look at, at firewall logs and, and alert off those and say, okay, now I need to pack, uh, pivot over to my PCAPs. So here's just an example of a snort alert on one of the labs that we have. Um, I took Snort on my Kali box. I had the PCAP of about 10,000 packets, and I just ran it into Snort against the emerging uh, threat rule set, which is absolutely free. And you could see here, it says there's a emerging threat info. It's generic, it says Susp suspicious post. So a system on my network sent a post request. So it's sending data to a website with a dotted quad with a fake browser. Okay, so essentially, it is not using a URL, it's using an IP address and it's sending data to an IP address over the internet. A little suspicious, something I wanna look at. We take a look at that time and date. It was March 21st, uh, maybe I'm reading that wrong. It's a little bit smaller screen, 2018. And from that, we can then dig into five or 10 minutes plus or minus that, that uh, event. Okay, here's an example of using Bro or Zeek, right? So it's, it's very simple. In this case, I just took one of the um, lab files, PCAPs, and I just ran it against Bro. So it wasn't in real time, it was after the fact. And we can see here then it created um, a bunch of logs like files.log, http.log, pe.log, ssl.log, weird.log. And within those, we can open those up and I can see things like a.png and I can see the IP address, the source and destination. And I can see, wait a second, a.png is a executable. 
I thought it was a picture, but it looks like they're actually putting a binary inside of a picture. So this doesn't tell me a full picture of what happened. I see the source and the destination, but now I know the date and the time that I need to go look at my full PCAP and start understanding the full picture of what happened there. Okay, so let's talk about collecting a little bit. And I bring this up, it, it's kind of a basic uh, topic, but myself for the longest time was not collecting everything I thought. So I just wanna go back to some networking CCNA type basics and make sure we're all on the same page with how to actually collect data. So you don't just put Wireshark on your computer and start collecting uh, traffic and think you're collecting everything on your network. Um, so back when we had hubs, it was really easy because we had one giant collision domain. So if you plug into any port on that hub there, you were essentially collecting everything on that network segment, right? Everything that was sent on a hub goes to every port. And so if I'm sniffing on one of the ports, I receive every piece of traffic. It was awesome. But since we don't really see a whole lot of hubs anymore, and it's more about layer two or layer three switches, um, they have a little smarter technology built in called the cam table, which when a packet goes to, um, is destined to someone on my network, uh, it takes a look at that and says, oh, I know where this MAC address is, that's on port seven, and it sends the traffic to just port seven and not every port on the switch. That's the downside for us as red teamers or blue teamers is that we're no longer seeing, seeing all that traffic, excuse me. With wireless though, um, it, it goes back to one large collision domain. So if you have a wireless network, as um, long as you're on the same SSID and there's no funky stuff going on like host isolation, in those scenarios, you have one giant collision domain again. So wireless networks, we're back to square one and we can collect everything that's on wireless, but we're not collecting everyone else who's plugged into the switch. We're not gonna see their traffic. Um, with a router, it works on layer three. Sometimes routers have the ability to do full PCAT capture, but you just gotta keep in mind that you're just looking at north south traffic. So that's coming in and out of your network through the internet. It's not looking at lateral movement. Um, but if I have one place I wanna collect, that's probably gonna be it. If I can collect in seven different points in my network, awesome, I'll be really strategic. But if I don't have that luxury, I do want north-south traffic because most of our attackers are gonna be remote. They're not going to be in our environment. If they are, we'll use EDR and other tools to help us. But most of that traffic, they either have to do command and control, they have to download a stager, some payloads, and we want to see that traffic coming in and out of our um, internet connection, essentially. So um, one other piece here. So if, you, if your router supports collecting, great. But if you wanna collect at a different point, like let's say you wanna look between a file server and the rest of your endpoints. So you really are interested in the file server traffic. In that scenario, you're probably gonna to wanna to put a, a tap in or you're going to want to do a span or mirror port on your switch. And so I used to do this all the time and I thought I knew what I was doing. I would just plug into a switch, turn on Wireshark and it'd be like, wow, there's a whole lot of broadcast traffic and my system is probably the top talker, but I don't see a lot of other traffic on the network. You're good to go. Little did I know because it was a layer two or layer three switch and there's a cam table, I was really only collecting my own traffic and I was collecting broadcast traffic, but no one else, you know, unicast or um, direct traffic. And so something else that you can do if you want to tap into a specific part of your network is you can use um, a tap there. And I've got a couple different pictures on the top there, that bluish one, um, that's probably going to be a gig based tap. If you look to um, some of the other ones there, those little smaller ones um, on the left hand side there, I think that one's made by Hack5. It's kind of cool because you can use a little phone um, battery pack and you can put it away under someone's desk. You can collect everything to a USB. It's, it's pretty efficient to, um, to use, but you're only going to get about maybe a day worth of, of traffic capture depending on the size of the network and it's only about 100 megabits per second. So you are bottlenecked there. I wouldn't put that on a gig circuit. You're just gonna kill your network. And on the right-hand side there, that one doesn't require any um, battery pack, um, but it is also limited to just uh, 100 megabits per second. Um, and then at the bottom there, that is a DIY poor man's tap. You can buy a couple of um, jacks and take some Cat6 cable and essentially build your own. I tried to do it a couple of times and it's pretty finicky. So I wouldn't trust that, but in a bind where you're in an environment where you have to tap in, you can't get into the switch or the router, and you don't have one of those taps with you. Um, side note, I always keep those taps with me for, for different scenarios where I have to capture that. But if you didn't, you could just basically build your own um, scenario like that. Um, the other piece is that if you do have access to 
a uh, switch, you can, in this example, we've got a Cisco switch. You can do a couple lines of commands and you can uh, collect traffic from either certain VLANs or from all the ports. Another uh, pro tip here from experience, um, if you've got a stack, let's say of 10 or 20 switches, you might not want to collect all traffic to a single port. I have done that and I have crashed a network. So you gotta be a little strategic. It is easy to capture everything to a single port, but the amount of traffic may overload one of the switches and cause, uh, cause some issues there. Um, and so we can use a tool like Security Onion to put a screenshot here. And uh, on the right hand side, it's a diagram of all the different tools. They've got um, Elastic Stack built in, they've got Syslog Collectors, CapMe, Snow, Snort, Bro, Sericata, all kinds of tools built in there. Um, all ready for you. So you can just drop in a pre-built box with two network cards into either a tap like we showed on the last screen or do a span or a mirror port and you can start collecting that way. Um, the cool thing is now Security Onion as of I think it was last year they added in the Elastic Stack or the Kibana dashboard. So you could have this up in your security operations center or your NOC and you could take a look at this graph and say uh oh and if you can't see that there that looks like the top ports by destination is 4444. And so go ahead, if you know what 4444 is and why that is something that's interesting, I might want to pivot over to, go ahead and post that in the Slack channel. Let's see if you get that right. So this is essentially looking at um, different logs and this could trigger your investigation and looking into um, full PCAP capture. It looks like someone in the, the chat there says reverse shell or Metasploit uh, traffic. Absolutely right. The default uh, port in Metasploit for reverse shell is going to be 4444. So that looks like someone sent up a default reverse shell, um, which is never a good thing to see in your environment. Um, and they didn't think or they forgot to change that port. So 4444 is something I always alert on and I'm always suspicious of because that is most likely evil in my environment. Um, one quick review here um, is that just going back to your, your CCNA type or Network Plus um, lessons is broadcast domains and collision domains. Um, in the orangish, yellowish, depending on your screen color there, you've got a uh, showing the broadcast domain. So if I am on a network segment connected to a switch, if there's a broadcast like, hey, an ARP request, I'm looking for this IP address or this system, it's going to everyone on the network. So you would be able to see that traffic if you're plugged into a switch but the collision domain is essentially where you're gonna see traffic from point to point. And in most layer two, layer three switches, I think all of them actually, that is gonna be a very small collision domain. Every port on the switch is gonna be its own collision domain, which means you're only collecting your own traffic and then broadcast traffic. So it is limited, just wanna bring that up. You can go back and do a little more research on that if that's a new topic. So, okay, where are we gonna drop one of these taps? Again, it depends on every environment, if I can select one option, it's gonna be north-south. I know someone in the Slack channel asked about that. North-south basically means in coming, network traffic coming into the network and out of the network. So to the internet and from the internet, essentially. Um, that's where I wanna put that. So that's where this, um, this red arrow shows. That's where I'm gonna drop my tap in. I just gotta be careful I'm not bottlenecking my network in that, in that scenario because that is a 100 megabit tap unless you, you know, spring for a gigabit tap or a 10 gig tap, which is gonna cost you at least $100, maybe a couple hundred dollars. Um, but you can obviously, if you're more interested on a server and your endpoints talking within your local network, you might put the tap um, basically right in front of the server you're interested in. So there's some different types of data that we can collect, right? So if you take a defensive type course, I know CCNA, CyberOps, they talk about that. A couple other security courses, they talk about the different types, but I find most people don't know the different types of data you can collect. So you've got session data, that's gonna be essentially like your NetFlow, your source IP address, destination IP address, source port, destination port and protocol. Awesome information to uh, collect. And if I, if I don't have the luxury of having full packet capture, I want NetFlow data because that can give me um, a picture of the flow of data going on in my network, in and out, all around. The one downside of session data or NetFlow, SFlow type data is that um, I don't really have context, so I do use, need to use some critical thinking and I do need to try and come up with some hypothesis of what's going on. So for example, if I see a bunch of UDP traffic all of a sudden going to my domain controller, I may think that looks like a denial of service attack where we need to respond to an incident, when in fact it may just be everyone's computer booting up at 8 o'clock and authenticating over LDAP, right? And that's going to be a ton of UDP traffic. So looking at that, 
you can't really understand the exactly what's going on and you have to start making some assumptions there. So uh, the, the pro though to session type data or net flow data is that it's, it's very small to capture. You can have retention of years and it's only taking, you know, a, a couple terabytes of data. Whereas um, full packet capture like Wireshark data, it's going to be terabytes of data within a matter of days. And I'll show you a couple examples here coming up. Um, we've got some transactional data like syslogs. We can see DHCP, DNS, web. But we can get a lot of that, not as detailed. We can get a lot of that through Wireshark. Same with NetFlow. We can get a lot of that stuff with Wireshark as well. Um, snort, um, I'm sorry, alert data is going to be like Snort or Bro. It's kind of like, hey, there's something malicious going on. We were looking at these other logs, and now we're generating a new log based off all the other logs we looked at. And then you've got statistical data, which is like utilization, um, bandwidth percentages, that kind of stuff. But really, full packet capture, we're getting everything so we can generate session type data, transactional data, alert data, statistical data, all from that full PCAP. So if I have the choice, I'd rather get full PCAP, and then I can get all that other information from that. But if we don't have full PCAP, we might have to go to one of the other options of um, data to collect and go from there. <clears throat> okay, so some other considerations here. Um, Wireshark, some of the defaults is that it saves or it captures the stuff into memory and it's temporary. So you do need to save it from time to time. Um, it also keeps running until it crashes or you stop it. And generally on a busy network, it's going to crash first. Um, and then it's going to capture all types of traffic, which may be good, but you may want to limit that, especially if you're having it run for a long period of time. Um, and then it uses a bunch of different dissectors that takes the binary that you're getting on the uh, copper or in the wireless connection that you're sniffing and it tries to then make it useful. So rather than seeing hexadecimal or ASCII, it's going to take that data and try and make it somewhat useful by giving you menus and subcategories that you can look closer at. Um, so I just want to show you here, this is an example of one of our prior clients, a very, very small client back in the day. Um, 2018, it's a four employee medical office. And in this four employee medical office, Again, just four people, most of the time they're doing medical procedures. They're not sitting there typing away or doing heavy email use. They generated in a single uh, week of traffic here, I'm sorry, they've got 46 gigs of data that was transferred. So if you can imagine just this office with four people, if they wanna keep their data for um, a year, multiply that times 52, okay? Then now we've got another week worth of traffic. This is a seven employee real estate office and one week worth of traffic capture was 67 gigs worth of data. Again, if you wanna have a year worth of retention, you have to multiply that times 52 and have that type of storage capacity. Okay, some of the wire cap, um, I'm sorry, Wireshark capture options. So if you go inside Wireshark, you'll see the menu at the top and you see capture drop down to options. And we can, <clears throat> excuse me, we can see there that there's a couple different interfaces like Wi-Fi, LAN, I've got some VMware stuff. So you can select to capture on one network card or all network cards, or you can select a few network cards and pick where you want to capture that data from. Um, you also have down at the bottom there where it says number three, you've got capture filters. And we'll go into more detail what that, uh, those are in a second here. Um, some other options that you have, if you go to the output tab, you can choose where to save the files you can choose to um, not capture forever, but you can stop the capture or create new files when certain conditions happen. And we can look at some of these here that you can stop it if there's a certain number of packets. So like, let's say 10,000 packets or certain number of files or the size gets to a certain amount. You can also tell Wireshark whether you want it to resolve MAC addresses or network names. I recommend unchecking those because Wireshark then creates more noise. So if it gets an IP address, it goes to do a DNS lookup, it generates a DNS lookup and then captures that as well. So you're generating more traffic than I think is necessary. Okay, so some capture filters, and I'm gonna compare capture filters and display filters later on, but I just wanna introduce them now. So um, the capture filters are using Berkeley packet filter, BPF syntax. It's the same syntax that you use with TCP dump. So if you ever switch over to that, it's gonna be using the same syntax. This is one thing I just wanna point out because when we get into display filters, which you're gonna get more familiar with tonight, is that they're different. And so you just have to get comfortable with both uh, syntaxes. Otherwise you're gonna be typing the Berkeley, uh, Berkeley packet filter um, syntax into a display filter and it won't work and you'll wonder why. You'll go back to the slide and say, I know it says host 
192.168.1.1 should work. It says it's a valid filter right here, but display filters are completely different and they use a different syntax. So if I'm capturing traffic and I want to narrow down on what I capture, so not capture everything, but let's say just capture traffic from a specific IP address of interest, I would do host and then put the IP address. If I do a display filter, that's going to be, a, I really captured everything, but now I want to narrow down on my screen what I'm looking at at this point in time. So one of them is going to limit what's captured into the file. The other one's going to limit what I see on the screen. And we'll go into some more detail in a second on that. Um, so I just want to give you a couple, you don't need to memorize these by any means. I just want to show you how some of these capture filters might be uh, useful. So let's say you've got TCP dump running, you're worried about heart bleed, or you're worried about the blaster worm. You can set up very specific customized capture filters to only capture traffic when certain events happen that are security concerns to you. Another example might be you set up a capture filter only to collect clear text HTTP traffic or only to collect clear text UDP traffic that is on a port associated with LDAP. So essentially authenticated or unencrypted authenticated domain requests. I'd want to see that and go fix that problem. So you can capture not everything, but very specific events and then have uh, full traffic when those specific events happen and then narrow down on that. So this is very useful. So you don't have to capture everything, but just what you're looking for. All right. So let's get into some of the Wireshark basics. Um, we don't really need to go into all the details here, but it's been around for a long time. It used to be called Etherwheel. Now it's called Wireshark. It's open source, great development team. They've got their own conference, which I highly recommend you attend. And they even have their own certification. Um, one key thing is protocol dissectors. And when you talk to a lot of old time security people, they will say, well, Wireshark isn't any good, or it's, you know, it's not a tool you should be using because dissectors are sometimes wrong. Yes, they're right. Sometimes they're wrong, but a lot of times they're right and the tool is awesome. So what is, what is Dissector? It essentially takes those ones and those zeros, the raw data that's coming across your network. And it is then um, applying, it's looking at it and saying, wait a second, this looks like HTTP traffic, or this looks like ARP traffic, or this looks like DNS traffic. Therefore, I am going to apply at the bottom right side of the screen there, certain columns or fields associated with that. So I'm going to present the user looking in Wireshark with the source IP address, destination IP address of this packet, because I know that packet has that information. ARP information doesn't have source or destination um, ports because it's ARP traffic. It works at a lower layer on the OSI model. But if I'm looking at HTTP traffic, I would want to see the source and destination port numbers. I would want to see the user agent string. There's different information I want to see based off the type of protocol I'm seeing. So that's where it becomes useful and awesome is that it applies those dissectors. Now, I think someone put in the Slack channel as well that when they use Mesploit or reverse shell, rather than using the default port 4444, you should use something like 443. So now can you imagine the attacker is using port 443, which is supposed to be TLS uh, traffic or HTTPS traffic, but they're really running the reverse shell there. Um, those of you who have been around security for a while, you probably have seen something like DNS cap, which exfiltrates data. It takes data in a, an environment and it will remove it from the environment, the corporate network over DNS. So it basically takes um, information like credit card numbers or financial data, or whatever the attacker is interested in, and it will funnel it out of your network over DNS ports. And it does that because almost every environment, even for the very few of you who are doing egress or outbound firewall rules on your network, you probably have port 53 open, DNS, because your systems need to figure out who Google is and the IP address for Google. So that is almost always allowed outbound. Therefore, we can send our reverse shells out that way, or we can tunnel data out that way. And so in those cases, if Wireshark looks at that and it says, oh, this is port 53, that's DNS traffic, I'm going to apply these rules, it's wrong in those cases. So in some cases it's wrong, but in most cases it's right. And that's why I still like Wireshark. You just have to take it with a grain of salt and realize that, and we'll actually have a lab there where I'm using port 80 and it's not real web traffic there. Okay, so some navigation here. I'm gonna skip over some of them. I left them in your slides so you can look at that later. But in the top left there, we have start capture. Um, the next button over that square is gonna be a stop capture. So it's going to stop your capture in its tracks because if you remember the defaults, it's going to keep running until you stop it or Wireshark crashes. Um, you can, the third button over from the left is a restart capture. So you can basically erase what's on the screen and start the capture from scratch. 
you can um, click the capture options icon or you could just go to the menu up top. Um, so navigation, uh, these aren't super important. We can go through the file menu. Um, you can find packets, a specific packet number, go to a packet number. So in the lab, I might say, go look at packet 53. So rather than scrolling through it, you can click the packet number button and then type in 53. And I'll let you kind of go through these yourself. Um, I do want to pause here on the different panes because I'm going to talk about these throughout the, uh, the labs and the workshop. And so it's important that we know what's what. And so when you open up Wireshark, you are going to see at the very top there the packets list. And that's going to be all the packets that you've captured in the file, um, in, the, in the packet capture. And then the middle pane there is going to be the details pane. And in the details pane, that's going to give you the information that Wireshark basically dissected. So it's going to say it, it will change. You'll see frame, ethernet, internet version, or IPv4 or IPv6, you'll see TCP or UDP. It'll even go further if it's HTTP traffic, you'll then see HTTP, HTTP specific fields like get, post, um, you'll see user agent strings, stuff very specific to web traffic. And then far below is gonna be the packet bytes. Normally I drag that down and I minimize that just because I'm short on real estate. And I really wanna focus on the packet list and the details pane. I rarely look at the packet bytes um, and in certain cases, then I can just drag it back up and take a look at it. But in the meantime, I really just, again, focus on packet list and packet paint. I'm sorry, uh, details paint. Okay, I'm gonna skip over coloring rules. This isn't super important for our, our short span that we have together here. I'm gonna now go into Wireshark save and export. So um, once we have captured packets, remember it's in memory at the moment. So if Wireshark closes at that point in time, um, we lose all that data. So it is important to save when you're done with it. Wireshark is a graphical interface tool and it can crash from time to time. Uh, it is getting more stable and it, it rarely uh, crashes if you have a smaller set of, of packets in your list. But if you do have like 10,000 or 20,000 packets, there's a good chance it will um, crash or not respond at points. So uh, what we could do, the default files, I know I keep calling it PCAP files, and it's because I'm a little bit old school. By default, Wireshark will save it as a file type of PCAP NG for next generation. Um, us old school people have been using Wireshark or Etherreal, we still call it sometimes PCAP, um, same kind of thing. Uh, some tools, it, very few these days don't support PCAP NG. So if you want to be saved, you could save it as PCAP instead of PCAP NG, but most tools in, in modern cybersecurity do support PCAP NG. Um, so when you do file save as, you've got multiple options as well. You don't have to just do PCAP or PCAP NG. You could save it to all kinds of other things. Um, export is kind of a cool feature. So if you export the data, it's a little bit different than save because save is going to save everything inside of your capture. Whereas exports, you can get um, smaller information. So imagine I have a 10 or 20,000 packet file and I want to send it to my analyst to dig deeper or my boss or supervisor or a friend or a post on the internet. In those situations, I don't really want to give them the entire 20 packet list and I might have some confidential information in there. So I may only want to give 10 packets or 100 packets or something very narrow um, so someone can focus on that piece. So if you go to file export specific packets, you will see, for example, if I have a filter, I can capture or export everything. I can just export specific selected packets, just packets I have a display on. So you can see almost that matrix there on the right-hand side where it says, well, you've got 4,092 packets, but you're only displaying 37 packets and you're only selecting one packet. So I can use that little grid there to say, no, just show all the packets that are HTTP related and it's only gonna print or export 37 packets into a PCAP, I then give that PCAP file to someone of interest. And you'll see that some of your labs, I don't give you in the beginning 10,000 packets to look through, it's too overwhelming. In the very beginning, you'll get files that have eight packets or 10 packets. And as you progress in your skills, I start expanding that and you look at 100 packets, 3,000 packets, 10,000 packets. And then towards the end, some of the harder labs, you have about 10, 15,000 packets and you have to narrow down on what you're looking for. The other cool thing is that you can do a print. And someone might say, why in the world would I want to print out packets? This is going to be, it's going to kill all the trees in the world. And you are right. But there may be situations where you're going to court and you need to print this out and you're not going to hand the judge a PCAP NG file. He's going to say, what is this? You say, well, just open it up with Wireshark. Wire what? So in these cases, you can print out the package for, packets for a court proceeding or for 
um, legal, whatever you need, or even just a supervisor or manager, or maybe your um, executive committee or your SLT or security council meeting, and you want to show them packets, but you know that the chief risk officer or the chief legal counsel isn't going to have Wireshark, and you want to highlight certain things and say, look, here's my evidence that Bob was an insider threat and they stole data over the network. Okay, so exporting objects. This is the part, if you've got kids in the background, if you've got um, cooking dinner, whatever it is, pause for a second and pay attention because this is the only part that it can get a little bit dangerous. Um, we can take the 10,000, 15,000, 100,000 packets that we've collected and we can extract objects out of that. It is a little bit limited. We can extract things like TFTP, um, SMB, uh, HTTP, and a couple other things outside of the PCAP. So it's not everything. But if there are files downloaded, and when I say files, it's not just like, oh, malware.exe, but I'm even talking about pages that users go to. When you go to a website over HTTP traffic, your browser is doing a GET request, which is asking for the index page of a website or the contact page or the about page of the website. And in those scenarios, that is being pulled down to the user's computer we can extract that. We can see the exact page that someone went to and in a forensic or incident response scenario, the user says, no, I didn't, I didn't go to that malicious website. That wasn't me. Or I didn't go to how to steal credit card numbers.com. You, you can go through in the PCAP and you could say, no, you did. Here's proof. And I can extract the exact page you went to. You clicked on these five URLs and here's all the five pages that you looked at on your computer. Um, obviously, we could do better job with forensics on the endpoint and do some uh, Windows forensics, but if you have network traffic where they've cleared history on their machine uh, or wiped it or you see cleaner, you have the network traffic still. So extracting objects, you can go to file, export objects, and from there, I've got a, a screenshot here, you can extract things, HTTP, SMB, TFTP, um, and so on. And you can bring those out of the PCAP file. And so if you can imagine here, you do have, let's say, wannacry.exe. This is where you're pulling it out of a PCAP file, which is not a something you can click on and execute on your system. But if you extract it out onto, as you can see there, this computer downloads, wannacry.exe will be sitting in your downloads folder. At that point, it's dangerous. So just be careful with the export objects when you have unknown traffic. Um, I often go to export objects. Uh, SMB F or HTTP and I look at it, but I don't save it to my own computer and when in doubt use a VM and just keep things safe. So here's an example. I extracted this HTTP page for the local ISSA chapter for Ventura County and you can see we're missing some styling sheets and stuff, but we can actually see that the user went to this um, this page, the home page, and they could see all the events that were going to happen, upcoming, whatnot. So you can actually pull the page that they saw pull it down, extract it out of the PCAPs. Very useful. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at some Wireshark profiles. <clears throat> so profiles. Um, this is something that I find incredibly um, useful. And I didn't realize the power of this originally with Wireshark. Um, I would, when I go into Wireshark, I'd see the default profile. And I thought, okay, well, we can do some things, customizing, but as I started investigating more and more incidents, I realized that, oh my gosh, I have 2000 tabs going on and I'm scrolling left and right on my Wireshark screen and not every protocol is the same. So if we take a look at, and you know what, I think I'm gonna get a little interactive with this. So let me share, um, change the sharing here on my screen. if I can find my mouse and I'm gonna actually pull up my VM and show you a little demo here before we jump back into the slides. Okay, so we can see my Kelly box here. Cool, thanks for the feedback in Slack. Um, and so if I open up Wireshark here, and I'm going to go to the workshop here, and I give instructions in a future lab of how to extract this if you're on a Windows machine, so don't worry. I'm gonna go down here to this one. Okay, so on the top here, as I mentioned, we've got the packet list. Here we, in the middle section, we've got the details pane. In the bottom, we've got all the actual bytes. I minimize this just because I only have so much real estate. So I just drag that down and then I focus on these two call, or the two rows here. And so if we can see the different colors here, Wireshark applies these rules, the coloring rules here. And I see DHCP. And so if I look at the details pane here, I've got the frame, ethernet, internet protocol version four, 
Then I see the user datagram protocol and then bootstrap protocol. So if I go down in here and I see things like um, client IP address or your next uh, server or relay agent, that's obviously very specific to DHCP traffic that has nothing to do with HTTP traffic. Um, similarly, if I go up here to the column with the, the display filter, and we'll talk more about display filters in a second. Uh, if I do tcp.port equal equal 80, so I'm just looking for TCP port 80 HTTP traffic. If I expand this, some HTTP traffic here, we can see even if I just go between this TCP protocol and this HTTP, you see how I get the hypertext transfer protocol field there? So it changes a little bit. So this is obviously very specific and I can see things like in accept, the get request. I can see the user agent string, which tells me which browser or system requested this link. So these are things that from an instant response or threat hunting or really security perspective in general, I'm curious about, right? And, and I can think of a hundred scenarios, but let me just come up with one here. What if I wanted to see, well, the user agent string in my environment where hundred percent Windows 10 shop and we all use um, Internet Explorer or Edge and that's it. So anything outside of that is considered not normal or I like to call it evil. And one of my favorite quotes is, and we've got it somewhere here is later is by uh, Sun Tzu, uh, Art of War. But another one by Sans Defer is they say, find um, or no normal, find evil. And so if you understand what normal is in your environment, it's a lot easier to spot evil in your environment. And so if we go back to that analogy of, I only have Windows 10 systems running Edge and that's it. We don't use Chrome, Firefox, we don't use Mac, Linux, anything like that. If I am then sorting or I am looking at user agents that equals, let's say this user agent string that I have here, and I can have a column for that and I can filter by that or I can sort by that, it's very easy for me to identify things that stand out from Windows 10 Edge. And so that may be something I wanna look at. I may also wanna have a profile here or a column because the number, time, source, destination, protocol, length, and info is, is cool. But if, if we forget about this details pane and I just minimize this here and I look at just the packets, it's kind of difficult for me to see evil. I mean, I'm looking at a bunch of traffic and maybe you could say, well, this IP address is evil here. But other than that, it's like HTTP traffic. How do I know if this is good or bad? I see it's a get request in the info, but I don't even see all of that. I kind of have to scroll, scroll, scroll. So if I could have a column for when I'm investigating HTTP traffic, and just focus on things like user agent string, get request, method of the request, those kind of things, that may be very valuable to my investigation. Similarly, if all of a sudden we're looking at potentially, or we've identified through hunting or incident response that I may be looking at things like um, uh, SMB lateral movement. And that's how WannaCry spread, right? Through SMB. And so, in this case, I don't really care about the get request or the user agent string. That may, that's not even relevant to my investigation. In those cases, I am interested in paths, file shares, um, systems connecting. I'm looking at files that are requested or written to. Those are columns I might be more interested in. And yes, we can dig into the details pane here on every packet and look at that. But could you imagine a 20,000 packet? I mean, even this one here at the bottom here, I see it's 9,443 packets. Do you wanna go, line by line and click on HTTP, okay, expand hypertext protocol, expand this and dig into it. Or wouldn't it be nice if we just had a column and we could sort by that? There's a question in the, the chat here about creating uh, customized profiles. Yes, that's exactly what we're gonna do. The first couple of labs is that you are going to set up your own profiles. Um, and so what we are gonna do here is that, um, I'll show you how that works, but I did wanna first show you why we're gonna do that. And in the bottom right corner here, we can see it says profile default. Wireshark gives you the default profile, which has the number, the time, source, destination, um, addresses, protocol, length, info. Um, you also get Bluetooth and classic, but you can create your own and you're in luck. In the downloads that we provided, you also get, um, <clears throat> you get some profiles that we've created. Um, myself, I've gotten some off the internet, but I'm gonna show you how to really create your own profiles based off your use cases and you could switch between them. So it'll make more sense when I switch between them later, but you can see if I go to Bluetooth, all of a sudden the entire screen changes, you know, it's very specific to Bluetooth type of traffic here. We're focusing on other things. So if I just switch and an investigation, all of a sudden now I look at a different type of traffic, I can switch back and forth very quickly there. Um, I do see a couple, I just wanna pause, a couple questions or things going on. I'm looking to detail in the Zoom chat, going to the hosts. 
I just want to remind people that we're using the Slack channel, the OWASP San, uh, chapter Santa Barbara for questions there. It makes it a little easier us to, to respond to you. So if you don't have that, I think Martine's already um, responded to those people, but I just want to say if there's questions, please use the Slack channel and we can get to those a little bit quicker. Um, okay, the next piece, let me switch back over to, uh, actually, I'm going to show you how to extract objects real quick just before I switch back to the slides. Um, and do some of the saving just since we have Wireshark open here. So if I go to file, save as, this is where I can select specific types of file types. Um, if we go to file, I go down to export specific packets. We can see in the bottom there, I've got 9,443 packets, but I do have a display filter only looking for HTTP traffic. And now if we do export, I can see, well, there's 5,000 packets that are going on port 80 or I can select here all packets, but I can get specific, or maybe it's the only this one selected packet that I'm very interested in. I can select that. I could do a range of packets, let's say 20 through 30, and I can export those. So we could see you know, 11 packets here essentially, and I could just export those. And that way you're not seeing everything in my PCAP. Um, to extract objects, um, this is something I do frequently. One of the first steps in incident response, I go to file, export objects, and if I see there's a lot of HTTP traffic, I'm gonna click that and look at this. We can see that there's a bunch of um, exports here. A lot of this is gonna be just web forms and things I'm not really interested, in, but I see there's a couple of images. It shows me the host name, the file size. We could see some of the requests here. Immediately this stands out and makes the hair on the back of my neck stick up. Why are there a couple different domains here? <clears throat> and the get requests look very similar, almost identical probably. And they're all doing a picture here, all right? A few different pieces here. This one was text, but it looks similar as well. So this is concerning for me as well, but this gives me a quick extract of all the different files that have been or attempted to be um, downloaded in this PCAP. So I can quickly look at this, look for anything interesting. This is the part I wanna remind everyone again, if I press save all, this is extracting all the objects onto my file system outside the PCAP. So if there is malware in here, it's now on my file system. So I wanna be careful on that piece. Okay, but at least just looking at the names and the types and stuff, that gives me some areas I might wanna jump into and look at it a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> um, one last piece, I'm gonna go back to that export and just show you one other cool thing. If I go back to HTTP exports, and I click on specific things here of interest, look at the back here. Um, my actual packets, when I click on this, I can actually see it's moving around here inside of um, the list. So I can actually close this now, but I can see where this traffic is happening. So I can now click on this, right click, follow TCP stream, and I can see some of this requests. Wait a second, doesn't that look a little suspicious there? That there was a picture, I believe it said it was, right, a.png, but does anyone know here, if I actually look at the red here is what my endpoint or the client requested. So it requested a get for this long string, which it's saying it was in um, gzipped, but then the server responded with a 200 message, which is okay. So it says, yep, you've asked for a file, here it is. File name is a.png, but if we look, and we even look at the content type, it's a image PNG, what is this? Does anyone know what this magic byte is at the start of the image that was downloaded? I'll give you a second in, in Slack here to respond. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, someone said a signature zip, more specifically MZ, MZ as a magic byte. Okay, there's a couple other clues here as well. This image cannot be run in DOS mode as people respond there. Um, Justin, I believe there said, and Ricardo said, uh, exe or executable, exactly. So it's called a.png, but if we actually look at the traffic, the file that was sent or served up by the server is the file header of MZ, which is basically how Windows knows that this is a binary, it's an executable. Like, example or wannacry.exe. You know, we don't know exactly what this is yet, but we can see the MZ. We can also see a sign here. This program cannot be run in DOS mode. We see PE here. We can scroll down. I can see parts of the binary, the, the data, the text, iData, etc. We can even start looking down here at some of the functions that are being called. Um, create window EX, register class. You, know, you can parse through this yourself to look for something. We can actually see the binaries going across the environment there. I've got a child walking in here. <laughs> um, 
And so we can look at the, the picture there and get more information. We could extract this out, but even without extracting it, we can take a look at um, some of the information about the binary there. We can dig down further. There's some conversation. Blue is the server sending it to the client. Red is gonna be the essentially the Windows 10 machine that asked for the file. Okay, um, I see there's a question back up. Let me scroll up here. So when you analyze Wireshark, there won't be like an alarm telling you that something is wrong. Correct, Jeff. So it's essentially collecting data. So imagine that um, the probably the best analogy I have is imagine you were listening to a conversation, a phone conversation. And back in the day before we had cell phones and stuff, we had landlines. If you had another, another phone in your house, you pick up the phone, you could listen to other people talking and you could hear what, what they were saying. So essentially imagine you picked up the phone, you hear someone else in your house talking, you press the record button on a tape recorder. And at that point you are collecting all the information um, that's being said back and forth between two parties. That's what Wireshark was doing is we captured everything that was sent and received, the communication between point A and point B. And once that, that happens, it's displayed here. So Wireshark itself will not set off an alarm. It won't pop up something and say potential malware. But throughout this workshop, I'm going to give you some ways that you can identify stuff like that. Because right now, all this is is a packet. This is a, a conversation from the source here, 50.63.125.1. It's a message, a packet from that IP address to destination 192.168.22.94. And there was a piece of a message here. And if we actually go back to the bytes here, this message here in hexadecimal or in ASCII on the right-hand side, this is the conversation it recorded. That's the piece of the conversation it recorded. That's all Wireshark's doing. And so that's kind of the point of this workshop is that a lot of people capture the network data and they're like, now what? I've captured the conversation, but how do I identify evil in my environment? So that's what we focus on. I wanna go through the basics a little more and setting up your profiles. Profiles is one of those things. And then I'm gonna give you clues and ways to hunt down evil once we do that. Okay, I see a few more things going through Wireshark. I'm gonna let uh, Martine and, and Joe respond or let me know if I need to, to respond to anything else there. Um, I'm going to now um, switch back over to my slides. Give me a second here. Um, the screen. Let me go right to the slides. Okay, so I've got my profile part here. A uh, couple more questions here. I'm just going to look at the chat. Uh, so there must be some legal implications of when and where we can run Wireshark. Um, yes, absolutely. Look at the first few slides. We had a disclaimer there about uh, potential wiretapping, and you need to be careful about those things. Happy to talk offline about that as well. Um, and then do you find Wireshark less valuable these days because a lot of malware is using TLS? Nope. Um, it, you definitely have some limitations, but in most environments, a lot of people are doing um, SSL or TLS decryption on the firewall. So it's doing man, man in the middle in your own traffic. And therefore we gain access to that information. Um, the other piece is that I'm going to show you, we're going to examine some TLS traffic in here, encrypted traffic. And I will show you how we cannot see everything that happens like we can with HTTP traffic, but we can absolutely still find indicators of compromise. We can narrow down the IP address and find out if it's outside the US, which doesn't always mean it's evil. But generally, when I see traffic in my network for clients that are, are working in the US going to or from North Korea, Iran, Russia, or China, it's probably, probably evil. Not always, depending on your environment and what you do and everything, but most businesses don't have any business operating in those four countries. Um, also, the NSA lists those as top uh, nation state attackers, and we see a lot of malware on a day-to-day -day basis coming from those locations as well. So it doesn't mean it's evil, but this whole class is about identifying indicators, or as I think Jeff mentioned, well, is it going to pop up and say, this is evil, take a look at this? No, but I'm going to show you how to identify things quickly that make the hair on the back of your neck stand up and say, I need to look into this more. This isn't normal. This isn't, you know, typical stuff. Um, but every environment's different. So I'm giving you the tools so that you can use these tools and apply them to your own environment. Um, and then I see, I know you're not there yet, but I tried earlier to unzip the files. I'm getting an error. So if you're on Windows, and you're trying to unzip the files, go ahead and use 7-zip. It will ask for a password. The password's infected, all lowercase. If you are using the Kali Linux system, you can use the unzip tool from the command line with the option of TAC or dash capital P and then put infected all lowercase as the password there as well. If you wanna skip ahead in the slides, 
Um, I think it's probably about another 20 slides ahead. There are some lab instructions which walk you through both on Windows and on uh, Linux of how to extract those PCAP files. Okay, um, and then maybe Martine can provide some of those details uh, for people in the chat as well so I can get back here. Um, so I should be sharing my PowerPoint again. If I'm not, please yell at me. Um, so profiles. So profiles contain custom information. You can have, as I demonstrated, a bunch of different stuff there. Um, we can have specific traffic based off or specific profiles based off the traffics that we're looking at. So how do we set up this new profile? I'm going to show you in the slides and then I will demonstrate it. So we're on the same page and then you'll do a lab so you can practice it. And there's actually three labs to really hammer the point that you need to make your own, um, uh, your own profiles. So setting this up, we can go to file configuration profile, and then we see a window pop up and we can see the default Bluetooth and classic. From there, you can click the plus button. And once you click the plus button, you can um, name your profile, for example, workshop IR, or workshop hunting, or whatever you really want to call it. And the lab will tell you exactly what to call it here in a second. Some of the default columns, which you've, um, you've seen here, are packet number, timestamp, source IP, destination IP, protocol, packet length, and information. I don't find these terribly useful. Um, so what we're going to do is once you create that new profile, you're then going to go to edit preferences and then columns. And within the columns there, you can see that you can add columns, you can uncheck columns, you can remove columns, you can change columns. And I will definitely demonstrate this in a second, but I just wanted to walk you through on the slides and show you that. Um, so when you create the new columns there, this is one way. Once you give it a name in the title, uh, column, then in the type, you can go through a drop down menu. And for example, we're going to do in the first lab source and destination port because I don't always trust Wireshark. As I mentioned, the dissector is cool, but I don't want it telling me that the traffic is HTTP. I want to see that it's port 80 and I want to make my own determination if that's port, if that's HTTP traffic or not. I want to see source and destination. I don't want to tell, I don't want it telling me this is TCP, this is ARP, this is that. I want to make that decision myself. So we're going to add the source and destination port unresolved. And one thing, and, and this is my OCD that kicks in, is that you could see there in the bottom of the slide, it's the source um, port number is going to the right-hand side. I cannot stand that. I want it to go to the left. So I'll show you in the lab how you can um, align that left and make things a little prettier so you've got an easy way to analyze the traffic you're looking at. One other piece of your profile, something I, I recommend constantly, is that um, once you, any profile you use, please, 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 please go to view, time display format, check UTC date and time, and use seconds. And do this because if, and I, I have this issue all the time, the rest of my team, aside from a couple members here in California, are in Colorado. And we are on here in Pacific uh, Standard Time, they are in Mountain Time. And even just for phone calls, when I tell, let's say, Joseph, who's on the, the chat here, hey, call me at 10 o'clock or five o'clock or whatever. Uh, we always have to specify, is that Pacific or mountain, right? And that's just, we're, we're very close to each other. But can you imagine if you have offices in California, New York, London, Sydney? There is, I saw at one point, SANS does a great job. They have an illustration and they show offices in those locations and a six month period or nine month period. And they show how many times that the time, there's time changes and differentiations between the different uh, four different offices in a six month period. It's like 17 different changes. And could you imagine an incident response? You're looking at this and saying, well, this happened at this date and time. And then you say, wait a second, I don't really know what time zone this is. So if we all work in UTC, we can do our offsets and get context and say, okay, I know this is really 5 p.m. Pacific or whatever, but having a standard time we're all starting off of is going to be incredibly useful and helpful in incidents. I hate that when, and I've even had that problem when I've worked with other people in collaboration, we've done forensics on endpoints and we're in different time zones, or we're looking at data that, of a laptop that traveled to different time zones. And then we're building a timeline and I have to go back and say, wait, did you add that time in mountain time or did you convert to UTC? And, the, and they say, uh, I can't remember. And now we have mixed times and the timelines don't match up. So please, 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 Use UTC for incident response and threat hunt here. Um, let's see, I've got, let me see if there's a couple questions in the chat here. Um, 
how do you set up the Wireshark to see if it unencrypted traffic? I think uh, Martin commented on that, but that's going to be in uh, typically you can get the certificate and you can import that into Wireshark. That's a little above the scope of this workshop. Um, but typically if you're capturing on your firewall and you set up SSL or TLS decryption on the firewall level, what happens is the firewall will generate a certificate. You install that certificate, a trusted certificate on all your endpoints. It used to be a lot harder because Firefox used its own store. Um, but you basically can push the certificate out through GPO. And then that is essentially making the firewall trusted. The firewall will then, um, the actual, the HTTPS traffic will communicate to the firewall rather than the web server. The firewall then inspects the traffic, re-encrypts it, and then sends it off re-encrypted back to the web server. So it basically man and middles all your web traffic. So uh, again, above the scope of this, but there's, depending on the firewall you use, all the big ones are, are doing it. It can be a little bit of a headache to, to maintain, but that's how you get visibility. Um, okay, I think we're done there. Martin, interrupt me if there's anything else there that I missed. Um, uh, falling back on the slides here with the view and setting the time display to seconds. Um, by default, the time is basically um, from the start of the capture to wherever you stop. So you can look at your sample PCAPs and it's like 65.536598 and it doesn't really help you. So switching that to UTC and then also going to seconds rather than dot one, two, three, four, five, six um, places after the second. It's, it's a little bit long. So I rather just look at the seconds rather than like the, the millisecond or zillisecond or whatever they're doing there. Um, okay, next one. So align columns, as I mentioned, when we do the source and destination port, you're going to see it goes to the right hand side, drives me crazy. So you can right click on the column and say align left and it'll be justified or to the left side, which helps me read the content a lot better. So once we create, and the next slide is gonna be a lab, once we create the profile and we've got this cool profile, but then you get a new computer or you have a Mac or whatever it is, or you're sharing with people, you can take the profile and you can share that. So if you've got profiles built out for HTTP, HTTPS, SMB, et cetera, um, you can then go to Wireshark, click on the help menu, go down to about Wireshark. And then on the folders tab, you're gonna see the personal configurations location. If you click on that, there's a directory called profiles and inside profiles, you can put your profiles. And so we are going to go into a lab and I'm going to show you the profile section of how to create that. I'm going to walk you through it and then I'll give everyone a few minutes to work on the lab themselves. So um, in this lab, we're going to create a new profile called IR workshop. We're going to remove a couple columns, add a couple columns and change the, the data there. So I am going to first switch over to my Kali box to show you how to do that and walk through some of the things we just talked to. And then I am going to switch back to the slides and leave that up for a few minutes and give you a few minutes to do that. When you are done with the lab, if you can um, put it in the Slack channel done, that gives me an idea of roughly how many people are done there. I know we've got about 70, 75-ish people in the Zoom meeting, but only about 50 in the Slack channel, but at least I can see if most people are done. Um, or when a majority of people are done, we can move on to the next lab. Um, and you could obviously do the labs by yourself if you're not quite done there. So let me switch back over to my Kelly box if I can find it. Okay, so you should be now seeing the screen share of my Kelly box. Um, you may need to open up, well, in this lab, you won't need to open up a PCAP. That's gonna be a later lab. But um, and so let me close this out just so I start on the same page and don't confuse people. Okay, so I am just going to open up Wireshark by itself here. I am going to go to um, edit, configuration profiles. We can see I've got a couple there. I'm gonna click this plus button. I'm gonna call this in the labs, I said Wireshark workshop. Press okay. And now we can see the bottom right corner, I've got that as a option. I'm then gonna go back to edit, preferences go to columns, and now I could see those default columns. So in the lab, I tell you to remove length and protocol. You could click the negative or the minus button there, but the, um, my preference is just to uncheck the displayed here. So it's more of a hidden and you can come back to it if you change your mind later. So I'm removing those columns, the number and protocol. I am now gonna click the plus button to add um, a column. It's called new column by default. I'm telling you to call it source port. And the type, we're going to click here and click the drop down, and we're going to go to source port unresolved, right? So that's not going to tell us, well, it's HTTP is the source. It's going to tell us the actual port number. 
I'm going to repeat that step for the destination port. So I cl click the plus button and I'm going to call this destination port. And in the type column, I'm going to drop this down and go to um, destination port unresolved. And I am then going to click OK. And one other piece I'm going to do now is I'm going to go down to, uh, where am I going to go to? I've lost myself on this one. There we go, under view and time display format. And there we're going to go to UTC date and time of date. I'm going to go to the view again, go down to time and display format, click on seconds rather than automatic from capture file. So this is the actual seconds of UTC. Okay, and so that is done. Now we have configured that. We can switch back to other profiles. I just want to show you the difference now. Um, if I go back into a lab file, we've got the columns here. Why did that not work? This is a horrible example now. Okay, if I switch back over IR. Interesting. I wonder if I didn't save that. Let me try this again. So I should have had the, um, the time got changed, but for some reason my ports, I'm not seeing those and I still see link there. Um, so something went wrong. Let me go back to edit, preferences, columns. That's weird. Those are, it unchecked those still, but I didn't get those new columns. So let me repeat that real quick for you. Okay, source port unresolved. We do destination port, go to the type, destination port unresolved, click OK. Okay, let me see if I got those now. I did, they're at the end there. So one thing you could do is you can drag these columns if you want, but I'll show you one other way to do it. If I go back over to um, preferences, columns, I can rearrange these this way as well. So my preference is to see it kind of like transactional data. So I rather see the source IP address and then the source port and then the destination address and then the destination port. So it, I can see it kind of like I would a NetFlow type log. So now I'm gonna press okay and we can see that the, um, it switched it for me there and the columns are rearranged. The other option is you could just drag these over and you can see that it moves this way as well. So those are two options for you. As I mentioned, it drives me crazy that these, the source ports and destination ports are all the way to the right hand side. So one thing that I do is right click, align left, right click on the destination port, align left, and I can kind of minimize these or adjust the column lengths here to fit my screen because um, destination port doesn't need to be that large. And a lot of time, I'll even rename these like uh, SRC IP and SRC port just to abbreviate it. So I don't even need the columns to be this large. You can see destination port, it's taken up a lot of real estate there, but we wanna keep that simple. Um, so that's your first step. You may need to open a sample PCAP um, file in order for these columns to work. I don't know why it didn't work the first time for me. Demos never work the right way. Um, but now we've got our um, IR workshop uh, profile. And if I switch, I want to show you before I switch back to the slides. If I switch the profile, we can see it's the same data. But as I switch through here, we no longer have the sort, source and destination port. We've got the number column and our time is the second since the start of the capture, not the UTC time. So I can switch back and we can see in real time there, I don't even need to close the PCAP file. I just switch profiles based off the traffic I'm looking at. And later on, we'll look at that and say, oh wait, this is SMB traffic. And you could just switch profiles and look at very specific information around SMB. So um, I am going to switch back here to the uh, slides and give you a few minutes to work on the workshops. Let's go back here. Okay, and I think there's a question about what are personal and global options for. I, I don't know where you're seeing that. Could you elaborate on that one? Um, and I can answer that question. Um, I am going to otherwise mute my, my mic. I'm going to um, step away to get some more water and I'll give you probably about uh, four or five minutes there to work on this lab, maybe a little bit less, stretch your legs, and we will get started at 6.55 Pacific time um, to continue with uh, protocol specific columns and then we'll go on to another lab. But you've got at least three or four minutes there to get everything set up. 
Okay, so I will mute myself here and be back at 6.55 p.m. Pacific. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so let's take a look at protocol specific columns, right? And so we touched on this and how ARP, I might be wanting different columns in my profile compared to HTTP traffic or HTTPS traffic. They're very different. Um, some of those examples, HTTP, I might want a user agent string, a get request, a host name. Um, I may want uh, for HTTPS, I've obviously want a certificate uh, name, which doesn't exist with HTTP. And I don't want columns for every possible protocol. It would just get absolutely insane. You could already see um, scrolling left and right with just these few, um, uh, few, few columns can be a little bit challenging. And as we get into other examples like user agent string, it's a really long uh, column. And so it can get overwhelming to scroll right or left. Real estate is really at a premium in Wireshark. Um, if we're using SMB, I might want a file read names or DHCP. I might want host names to identify a system um, on my network. So different use cases, different um, things. And what we're gonna do in the next lab after um, I set this up, it looks like I got a typo there, host host, it's supposed to be HTTP host. Um, we'll set up a profile for HTTP traffic and then we'll set up another profile for HTTPS traffic in addition to our IR, IR workshop profile. And we can then switch between those in some of the more advanced labs that we're gonna go through later on. So this is still a lot of housekeeping set up um, learning how to utilize Wireshark, and then we'll get into actually analyzing some malicious traffic. So um, in this example, what I'm gonna do is show you another way to create a column. Um, one thing that I do is I, I typically will look at the traffic I'm interested in, and then the details pane, I dive into the subsections like host, as you can see there on the screen, or user agent, and then you can right click on those fields and apply them as columns. So you don't always have to know exactly like source IP address or destination IP address or source port, destination port, those typical ones setting up profiles. If you don't know what it's called or how to get a column, but there's something in a packet you're interested in, right click on that in the details pane, apply column, and then you'll see that column show up. So with HTTP, one of the labs that I'm gonna have you do, and I'll demonstrate that before the next lab, is that we are gonna get the host column. And why that's important is that any HTTP traffic, first of all, I don't like seeing HTTP traffic on any of my clients' environments. It's unencrypted. Um, well, I like it from an instant response perspective and seeing full visibility. I don't just, I just don't trust it, right? Why, maybe if you're doing an informational page, it's still okay. But for the most part, legitimate businesses use HTTPS and um, most of the big websites my, my customers should be going to, um, they've got that valid certificate and everything's good there. So if it's HTTP, I wonder why, and it's, it's not evil, but it makes me wonder whatever they're doing is potentially um, leaking out and I wanna see what that is. So um, what we're gonna do is create a, a column on host, which is gonna tell us what's the server name and why that's interesting is because if I just look at um, the source and destination IP address, I can't identify that. Maybe you're smarter than me and you've got a, um, a regional internet registrar memorized in your um, brain and you know what 23.215.98.249 is. Uh, I don't. So in that case, having that host field is, is really helpful. Um, and that way I can see, oh, it's msftncsi.com. That's legitimate. So let me skip that. But if I look at 50.63.238.1, I don't know what that is either. But if I have a host field, I can see, oh, that's bv.truecompassdesigns.net. Uh, that's not in the Alexa top million domains, so it's a little suspicious to me. I may want to do a who is lookup on that. But this is an easy way for me to identify what the hosts are, look at the names. If I see something you know, now and I look at something like... Um, you know, covidmap.com or something like that, I know that's probably not legitimate and I may want to investigate the endpoint 192.168.22.94 on my environment. Um, so this just gives me a quick way I can filter and sort by that host column. Um, we go to HTTPS server. So we're going to create another profile called HTTPS investigations. There, what we're going to do is we're going to use a display filter um, to look at the SSL handshake and we're gonna look at the client hello. This one's a little bit messy to dig into, so you might wanna come back to the slide and look exactly where it's at. Um, and I will do a demo here in a second, but we're gonna dig into the client hello, we're gonna dig into the extension called server name, and then further we're gonna dig into server name indication extension. And within that, we're gonna see the server name and we can make that a column. So 
in the event that we do have HTTPS traffic, it's encrypted and we can't see the full um, data. What we can do is we can apply that as a column and we can see during that handshake, the SSL TLS handshake, we can take a look at the server that's serving up the certificate and at least we can get almost like a host name there and identify if that is a legitimate domain or not. We're not gonna see any traffic past that unless we're doing SSL TLS interception or we have the certificate for the client and we're intercepting it that way. But if we don't have that, in most cases, we won't have that set up. In an investigation, we can take a look at at least that, that handshake and find out who they're talking to, not necessarily what they're saying, but who they were talking to. Um, so I am, this, this brings us into the next lab of doing this. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch back over to my Kelly box and walk you through that and I'll give you a few minutes to practice that. Okay, so I am going to create a new profile. Same way we did before, we're gonna to go to edit configuration profile. I am going to create the first one's gonna be called IR HTTP traffic. Okay, and then I'm gonna press okay. I can see that I've got these panes again, so I gotta adjust this. So I just have the packet view and the details pane. I am then going to, um, let's see, I tell you to go back into edit, do the same things we did last time just for the practice to go into the columns, remove the packet number, remove the protocol. I'm going to add source and destination port again, just like we did last time. Got the source port unresolved and then the destination port unresolved. Okay, so we've got those. And then now the ones that we didn't do before are we're going to add the HTTP host and a user agent string into our profiles here. So I'm gonna press okay. I'm going to now go to the time settings again. I'm going to do UTC for best practice. I'm gonna go back to time and do seconds. Okay, and then I'm going to um, I'll realign some of my columns here. So I've got source port right over here and right click on it, align left. I'm gonna go grab my destination port, drop it there, right click, align left. So this is, this is to this point, it's the same thing as the first lab. Um, now what we're gonna do is in the display filter, so right under the buttons that you have here where it says apply display filter, I'm gonna go ahead and type, um, you can sort through your traffic and you can look for HTTP traffic. I just think it's a little bit easier if, um, go back here on my screen. If I do HTTP dot request, and it just narrows down, these are all the requests that we're looking for, so I don't need to go search for the packet. And then in the details pane down here, I'm gonna expand hypertext transfer protocol. And then I can see the host and the user agent. So I'm going to right click on the host and go up here to apply as column, click that. And then I'm going to go to the user agent string, right click, applies column as well. And so now we can see here that I've added, and let me minimize or narrow some of these columns, that I have the host and I have a user agent string. And so now we can sort by this. So I can click on the top here and I can see that it's now grouping these domains and I can see how many get requests were at each of these um, domains. And obviously something like Microsoft.com, I know these are a little bit different here, Microsoft.com or Amazon.com might not be as suspicious. So I really wanna narrow down on some of these other ones like why is there a get request to an IP address? It should be a domain name or bvtruecompassdesigns.net. Some of these look a little bit suspicious. If I've got something like Silence or CrowdStrike, maybe I'm not as concerned about those. And then I can also go over here. In this case, it's not really gonna be that helpful, but if I sort by, um, user agent, I can see pretty consistently, I've got the same user agent string. So this is devices that are authorized in my environment. It looks like maybe, um, uh, what is this, a Windows 7 device, pretty consistently there. But you might see something like curl or nmap or nikto, like pen testing tools or hacker tools, and that might stand out. In this case, the user agent isn't that important or, or valuable to us. I'm just gonna take a quick glance and see it's pretty consistent there, nothing stands out. But definitely these hosts, these quad four IP addresses as a, a website, you could see here the full request, HTTP colon slash slash 77.225.141.195. 
that is not something a, a normal user would type out. So this is something I would want to investigate in. And we can <clears throat> do plenty of things after this that I'll show you. But I want to um, create that new profile for HTTPS traffic and give you a chance to do that as well. So that's what you're going to do for the HTTP profile. We're then going to go back over here to edit configuration profile. I'm going to create a new profile. Let me swing back here to the lab instructions. The new profile is going to be called ir-https-traffic. Let's enter. And then I am going to click OK. Make sure that I am in the HTTPS traffic there. I am going to clear my display filter. I'm going to try and minimize this bytes. I've got a little bit of freezing going on here. Come on. There we go. Just thinking about it. All right. And then what I'm going to do is the same basic setup again, remove the, the length and the protocol. Um, so let me go back through edit, preferences, columns. I'm going to remove the, again, whichever ones you want to think in the, the lab, I say move length and protocol, but I'm going to even remove um, packet number sometimes. So length and protocol. And then I'm going to add here source port. Just getting repetitions with this source port unresolved. We'll go here to destination port. Destination port unresolved. And then now I'm going to actually so move these over. So I'm going to move this so I don't have to do it on the main screen. So I want source IP, then source port, destination IP, destination port. And then I'm going to press OK. And now that sorts that, I'm going to right click here and align left, right click, align left. And then we're going to change the time again. So I'm going to go to view, time display format, UTC going to view time display format, go to seconds. This is all the stuff we've done before. And then from here, this is where we do something a little bit different. I see a couple of questions I'll try and answer in a second in the chat. Um, the one piece here, you can go look for the handshake, but one piece that makes this a little bit easier is in the display filter. If you type ssl.handshake.type equal equal one. Okay, and this we can see in the info here, these are the client hellos. I don't think I have enough RAM on this virtual machine. It's kind of laggy for me. Um, and then within this, if I go down and expand the socket, uh, the secure socket layer, and then TLS, and then Handshake, and then down here, extension, I am looking for, I might need a different packet. Hang on. There it is. So you might have to click through the packets here and look for extension server name. And then I want to extend server name indication extension. And then finally at the bottom here, this is the hardest one to get to, um, server name street-crime.com is the one that I'm seeing here. So I'm gonna right click on that, apply as column. And now we can see in the column, I don't always have that because again, it's the client hello. So it's the initial part of the conversation. I'm not gonna see it for the entire conversation, but it lets me then click on the server name here and I can sort by different domains that they, the user has been to or that's been on my environment with uh, that there's been a valid uh, handshake essentially. So I can see that the only valid one in this capture is streetcrime.com. If I do a who is, I'm sure it's registered in the last 24 hours um, when this was taken, obviously. And then there's a bunch of other evil stuff that we'll look at based off of this. But this at least, this is as much as we can get uh, from SSL TLS traffic without getting the certificate and intercepting traffic, but at least we can see volume of traffic, we can see conversations, and we can see the actual server that they went to. And that's still valuable because even though most malware is still using HTTP, they're not bothering with uh, HTTPS, but even if they did, we can see that the domain name streetcrime.com might not be the worst in the world, but if you correlate that with Alexa top 1 million, it's definitely not there. If you do more threat intel and you do a who is, it's, it's probably registered very quickly from the time that you've seen it. Most malware or, or evil sites only last 72 hours, if that. And so you could do some more intel based off of that. Um, let me look at the chat here. So we've got, can you copy profile and then just modify it rather than doing the full scratch? Absolutely. Um, and so if I, I'll demo that. So if I go to the menu, I go to help. I go to about Wireshark and I click on profiles, I'm sorry, folders, and then personal uh, configuration. 
um, I've got profiles. And then in here, you could see these different ones I made. So absolutely, you could right click, copy, you know, paste or do that. The reason I do it from scratch is I, it's the iteration with people who haven't used Wireshark before. And I just want that repetitive experience by adding columns, adjusting it. So it's almost second nature to you at that point. But yeah, absolutely. You can take these profiles and make like a, a template one. So I could easily do here, copy, paste and call this one. If I rename it template. Right. And this is the one that I basically build out so that that could easily do that. Um, let me look at what else. Um, there is a copy option under the configuration profiles. Maybe that's what we're talking about. Is there a way to set a time display as default anywhere? Um, once you set it once um, in a profile, it should be that way. But every, the, the, every profile pretty much has the, the default setup for Wireshark. So the best bet would be what uh, Lisa B said here was if you kind of create a template there and then you start from the template and that's that's probably the best way to keep the UTC time the seconds so you don't have to keep doing that um other questions okay so Martin answered some of that uh, which file do we need to open for this lab so the file that I generally just use for demos because it has most of the stuff I want and that's a good question um it's it should be if you've got the Kelly box it's on in the workshops um otherwise it's in the pcaps directory and it should be not common traffic sorry labs and then malicious traffic one this is the one that has http https traffic all kinds of stuff there and i think i'm going to switch back to my powerpoint in just a second but that might have been an oversight on my part that i did not tell you to open that so in the slack channel i give you a few minutes here to um, complete these labs i'll give you till 7 uh, 20 pacific time um, when you do that i'm going to type into the chat of the directions of how to decompress the PCAPS file and which one to take a look at there. So I'll be posting that into Slack in just a second. Um, if there's no other questions on, on that piece, you can keep the questions coming, but I am going to switch back over to my slides so everyone can see the instructions there. And once again, 7.20 Pacific time, I'll continue and make sure everyone's done, but we'll um, go into GYP at that point and there's another lab there. So let's take a look at GOIP now. Um, so this is something that I find to be incredibly um, uh, useful. It doesn't, again, as I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily say um, there's evil on your network, but it's pretty easy to identify stuff that doesn't look right and that you need to investigate a little bit further. So one of those examples I give, and I, and I always pick on those four countries, but I've seen countless NSA briefings and they keep pointing the finger at the nation state attacks they see are from Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And so I, I know someone, a client, and they've got someone in Iran right now. It doesn't mean that that's evil. And if I see that on their network, it's definitely the employee working or most likely the employee working. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. You have to know what normal is before you can find evil in your network. Um, but GYP provides a great deal of context about where a IP address is located. Not perfect. Yes, someone can use Tor. Yes, someone can use AWS or Azure and funnel through that in different regions. Absolutely possible. But um, I think too many people are focusing on the perfect solution fallacy and there isn't one. But all these things I'm teaching can at least give you clues and things to start identifying and look at. And if it helps you identify 80 or 90% of the evil, that's better than nothing. Okay. So by default, Wireshark does not come with any GOIP database, nor does TCP dump or T-Shark or any other tool. It is just looking at packets and displaying them to you or sniffing packets and displaying them to you. However, a cool thing about Wireshark is that it does support a free or paid version of um, GOIP address database, and it can correlate that information for you, which is pretty cool. Um, this lab, I will let people know that occasionally there's a few people, it seems to be like one or 5% of the people that have issues with this lab and on identical versions of Wireshark, identical databases, I don't know why occasionally it doesn't work. Um, so if that's you, Martin, Joseph, myself, will try and help you, but um, just know that you, you may be SOL in certain cases, but most of the time this does work for people. And we have not identified why those few select people will not get this to work. So 
there, um, what you can do is you can download, I've got an older version. So in the real world, I would download right from the source and even consider a paid version, which is more accurate. I have a version from a couple of years ago. I downloaded the GeoLite city, country, and ASN, ASN databases for you. And uh, we're gonna add those to Wireshark to add some context for us. Okay, so the way that we set this up, um, it's gonna be a little different depending if you're using Windows or Linux. Um, my preference personally is to store in a Windows. I like to create a directory called GOIP in the root of my C drive. If I'm using Linux, I like to put it in user or USR slash share slash GOIP. So I create a directory there and drop the um, databases in there. When you extract the, um, the zip files, the GeoLite um, ASN, country, and city, it's going to create subdirectories. So you can kind of see there in my screenshot, I extracted them and there's folders. What you need to do is you need to grab the .mmdb files, those are the actual database files, and put them in a common directory like the C GeoIP or user share GeoIP directory. So all three of those, the GeoCityLite ASN.mmdb and the GeoLite um, to uh, city and country, all those .mmdb files, the three of them need to be in the same directory to make this easy. Once you have extracted those there, we can then go to preferences, name resolution, maxmine database directories, and then edit the path and basically add those path of C GeoIP or the user share GeoIP or wherever you put it, you just have to add that path into Wireshark so it knows where to find those. Once you do that, um, you generally need to restart Wireshark in most cases to see that data. So once we do this, and I'll do a walkthrough in a second here, um, here's the screenshots. I went into preferences. I went to name resolution. And then at the bottom there of that window, we can see ma uh, max bind database directories. I clicked edit. And then I add in a path. And you can have multiple paths. You could have other things. Uh, prior versions of the lab, I used to have a directory for each one of those databases, but it got too confusing for students. So now I just say put it in a common directory, add one path, press OK, and uh, restart Wireshark. Okay, someone mentioned the path already exists um, in Kali. Absolutely, that's why I picked that path, so you wouldn't have to remap that one. The Windows users, you will have to remap it. It tries to go in some um, program, uh, program data directory that's a little bit confusing. Um, so the GYP setup after you restart it, we're then going to um, look at, we're gonna open up malicious traffic one, and we're gonna look at the uh, IPv4 data we're in the details pane, we're gonna expand that and we're gonna look for source or destination GOIP. And then we can add whatever our preference is. We can add the city, the state, the country code, um, the ASN number, whatever makes most sense for you. Um, so I'm gonna show you the, the details pane here. Once you expand, you can see internet protocol version four, IPv4 uh, v4 in the details pane. Then we see source. It, it obviously depends on which direction of the traffic you're looking at. If you're looking at um, traffic coming from the internet to an endpoint, you're looking at the source GOIP info. If you're looking at traffic from one of your devices inside your network going to the internet, you're looking at the destination GOIP info. So you may wanna have a column for both the source and destination, um, and then whatever your preference is there. Any of those source GOIP info in the red box there, you can right click and apply as column. And so in some cases you may wanna see that, um, look at the country code like US. And when you look at US, um, you can then do filters like not US, not Canada, not Mexico, not wherever we do business and look for other things. Um, that is good in most cases, but you may also want to consider the organization as well, the ASN there, because um, just knowing that it's in the US doesn't tell me enough. Just looking at the city and seeing that it is in uh, Boardman isn't enough for me. But seeing that the organization assigned to that IP is Amazon.inc or Amazon Inc., that's important information that gives more context to the traffic I'm looking at. So it really is up to you and the traffic you're looking at. You can do any one of those combinations based off of the traffic you're looking at. So here's an example of um, a column. Um, a filter I did is ip.geo.source summary and it gives me all that information, but the column is really long. So I would consider um, picking just the country or maybe the country and organization and using those as columns. So in this case, we can see one of the filters I did is I did IP, so it's an IP protocol, and not IP geo country equal equal United States. So I'm saying show me all traffic in this PCAP that is not 
um, source or destination US. So that's going to give me all things going in and out of other countries. And that's something I'm going to take a look at and investigate a little further. So this brings us to the lab. Before we actually do the lab, I'm going to do a little walkthrough and kind of show you how that works. Let me switch screens here. Okay, I'm going to open up the malicious traffic one. 2017-03-25 traffic analysis exercise. Okay, and once I am in here, the next thing that I'm gonna do is switch profiles to the IR HTTPS traffic. Okay, and then I am going to um, extract the .mmdb files for the ASN, the city, the country, um, and put that into the respective uh, directory. So I'm going to minimize Wireshark. Go back to the files provided, the GYP. And I've already extracted these here. You could easily open them with Archive Manager or through the command line you could do, or even just click Extract here. Um, or you could do it through command line if you prefer, but it's going to give you these three different directories once you extract it. And for example, the ASN here, this .mmdb one is the one I'm interested in. So I can right click, copy, and then I can locate the directory. So I'm telling you if you, if you are in uh, Linux, and I'll even show you here where we're gonna drop it. So if I go back to Wireshark, someone mentioned it's already in here, USR share GYP. So I can drop that in here, paste. I'm gonna open up, minimize this, so I've got a better screen view. Oops, I just closed what I wanted. Back to Wireshark, go to GYP. Uh, which one did we just do, the ASN? So now we're gonna do the city. I'm gonna copy this, paste it in here into my GYP share. Then I'm gonna go back and do country. Grab that .mmdb, right click, copy, paste it in here. Okay, and then I may need to restart Wireshark. And I'll show you why. So if I just go into one of these packets that we already had and I go to internet protocol, I, well, in this case, I got it. Sometimes you will see this destination GYP. Other times you have to close Wireshark and reopen the PCAP before you see this. But if you expand in the details pane, internet protocol version four, you're going to see, depending, like I said, depending on which way the traffic goes, you're going to see destination GYP or source uh, GYP. If you expand that further, this is where we're going to see then you know, city, country. And so my preference is probably do destination country, right click, apply as column. And then I'm going to clear my display filter so I can find something with a source that doesn't look like it's local traffic. So see how in the source column, I've got a 73.73.45.131. I know that's not a local IP address, so I'm clicking on that one. And now I have, instead of the destination GOIP, I have the source GOIP. And here I can click on um, G source GOIP country code, apply as column. And now let me minimize this a little bit so we've got a better view. And now we can see that I've got the um, destination GYP country and source GYP country. I might, because these are so long, right click on them and edit column and just name this something a little bit smaller, like, um, I can't remember which one I clicked on now. Is that source? Oops, I named that wrong. So let me, it was the destination, I believe. So dest. destination country. And then on this other one here, I'm going to right click on the source GYP country, edit and call it SRC country. And let me kind of just realign these columns. So I've got a little better view here. Okay. And I'm going to try and zoom in so you can see this a little better as well. But we can see here that I've got United States, Ireland, Germany, and I can obviously go to the top column there and click on it to filter. And now I can see all the different countries, Brazil, right? If my, if my company doesn't do work in Brazil, I'm wondering why there's some of these things, Bulgaria, 
this is the kind of stuff that stands out to me when I'm looking at this China. Again, that's one of those four countries that stand, my, my, the hair on the back of my neck stands out even more um, than some of the other ones. And I look into this, we've got Colombia, Costa Rica, Czech, Denmark, Egypt, Dominican Republic, all these things. If my company, let's say is a mom and pop company or a medical office that's in the US and they don't do any business outside the US, why are we seeing this stuff? And this, this then I start thinking, what is this traffic? I dive into this traffic. When I see US, it doesn't mean it's, it's ultimately good traffic. It just means it's a little bit less abnormal if my business focuses in the US. So um, once you create some of those um, based off your preference there, um, let me see what else we have. We look at the traffic, we look at source destination country. That's pretty much what the lab is about. Um, there is a bonus there if you want to take a look at filtering this down further, because obviously there is some traffic from to and from the US. So I give you a way to exclude US. If you do IP and not GOIP country United States, you will then exclude stuff from the US and only look at things outside the US, which may be a good starting point for threat hunting or an incident where uh, you're trying to figure out where things came from, the malware or where data went to. Um, it definitely helps out there. So I am going to uh, take any questions on Slack there. I am also going to switch back over to the PowerPoint to provide you with the lab. And I will give, um, this one's a little bit more expensive. So I will give, I'll check in with everyone at 740 Pacific, but I'll probably give a few more minutes after that and see where we stand. So you should see now the PowerPoints on the screen again and with the lab instructions. And again, those were posted in an S3 bucket that you could download. So you have the PDF version where you could follow along. So let's take a look now at some other tools outside of Wireshark. This, this course is designed around Wireshark, but um, that's not the only tool and you don't have to limit yourself there. I wanna keep it simple for the workshop, but in the real world, I generally go a little outside of just Wireshark to add some context. So T-Shark, as I talked about, if you have a scenario where um, you need to mass deploy packet capture, it doesn't make sense to go to 1200 machines and install Wireshark one by one. Um, you can use a tool like T-Shark or TCP dump to mass deploy and mass capture those, the things you're interested in. TCP dump is my tool of choice for packet capture, super efficient. Um, you can mass deploy it, it's scalable, uh, very easy to install on Ubuntu or Kali Linux. I think Kali Linux is already pre-installed for you, um, but you can see there a simple command like TCP dump, um, you pick the interface, tell it not to resolve IP addresses and port numbers so they're unresolved. You tell it the snap length of zero, so basically capture everything, V for B, B for boast, and then you can see port 80, I'm using the Berkeley uh, packet syntax there. So the same thing as the Wireshark cap, uh, capture, we can specify that, we can write out to a file using the, the W option so we can create PCAPs or see it in real time. Um, one thing is once you have the PCAP, sometimes students say, well, this course wasn't, you know, we didn't go enough or I kind of got some basic info, but I've got really big PCAPs and I don't know where to start. Well, you might want to consider something like CloudShark or um, a tool like Packet Total. One disclaimer I have is that when you use free tools on the internet, whether it's VirusTotal, Hybrid Analysis, CloudShark, anything where you upload data from your environment, it may become public. So think about if you've got clear text passwords in your PCAP capture, if you were collecting everything and there's all kinds of things in your environment or the usernames, passwords, usernames, IP addresses, when you upload this, it may become public. Um, I'm not 100% sure on CloudShark. If you read their terms of service, you'll be able to identify that. Um, I think with the paid version, you might be able to have private um, repositories, but um, definitely with Packet Total, it becomes public. And the last thing you want is you're investigating a potential breach and then you cause a breach by uploading all your network traffic there. But these tools are incredibly valuable because you can upload your PCAP and it runs it against Bro, uh, Suricata, other tools like that against the emerging rule threats and other rule sets to identify evil. So Packet Total is similar. Um, here's an example of, of Packet Total. I uploaded, I think this was traffic analysis one, your lab files. I uploaded it there because it was a lab environment and I know I didn't have any private information that, that could compromise my network. Um, so my lab environment, I uploaded that and we could see that by just quickly parsing through that, we didn't even have to set up columns. I didn't have to know about handshakes of traffic. Immediately, it identified things that we probably would not have identified just looking at Wireshark. So the very first one there gives you the timestamp 
and it tells you the alert was the emerging rule threat. That's what ET is. It's Tor known for a relay or a route to an exit node. So it's telling you that there's traffic in your environment that's going to or from a known Tor relay. That's something I definitely want to look into. Um, and we could see the um, port number, the, send, the sending port number wasn't suspicious, but the next line down there, same type of thing. And then we keep going down, you know, there's a possible Tor SSL traffic, there's a known relay, and we see the port number. So it provides us some information very quickly. And you could see there on the sender IP, I could even click that little icon and it'll show me uh, GOIP information as well. So this is another option. Again, I, I preface it with be careful because whatever you upload becomes public and you may cause a breach. But if it's a lab environment, I absolutely would upload this first and see what um, what they did. I don't have to do any configuration with bro or download the emerging rule threats or anything else like that. It just gives me this information quickly. Another tool, Network Miner. You may come into an environment and they say, no, you can't use Wireshark. It's, it's open source. We don't trust it. Um, I've been to those environments where they say, and we use AppBlocker. In AppBlocker, we lock our down all of our endpoints where you can only install things with a Microsoft signed certificate. Okay, so in those cases, I'll use something like Network Miner. And that's what this slide's about because I had some um, students that said, I can't use this in my environment. What else can I use? So there's tools like Network Miner. Um, Microsoft makes some other tools that, that's part of sys internals and you can capture traffic. And in those cases, that may become valuable to you. So Wireshark isn't the only tool, but it definitely does a lot. After this workshop, so traffic analysis one and some of the other ones, I downloaded those PCAPs from um, malwaretrafficanalysis.net. There's plenty of labs that I staged myself, but I wanted to give you the, um, I think malware traffic one, two, three, and four, those were all from this website. So I wanted to show you that you could go and download those. It's one of the largest repositories of PCAPs of malicious traffic. And you could do, as you can see, over 1300 labs yourself um, after this course. Um, the author is, is, he speaks at all kinds of conferences. He's well known in the industry. He's a threat hunter from Palo Alto. Um, he does a great job by providing you with all these PCAPs where you don't have to set up your own lab environment. Some other links, you can come back to these where you could download other sample PCAPs and captures and stuff like that to help you. Um, once you extract data, so we talked about object extracting and, and looking for, I think in the demo we had a.png, which turned out to be a binary. In those scenarios where you have extracted content, um, this kind of bleeds into another workshop I have, and maybe we'll make a YouTube video, um, Fundamentals of Malware Analysis. In those workshops, I talk about then how to take those binaries and dissect them statically and dynamically. But you can use tools like um, Virus Total, Hybrid Analysis, Reverse It, et cetera, Cuckoo Sandbox on-prem. Again, 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 make sure you're not uploading files that you extract that you thought were malicious, like let's say financialdata.excel, and it was really legitimately your, finance, your company's financial data, and now you expose that to all the security researchers on virus total. So there's a time and place for these tools, but I'm just showing you the next step, and this bleeds into other classes and workshops that I do. Um, you could also take the PCAPs, such as the traffic analysis one. And in this screenshot, what I did is I set up Snort on my Kelly Linux box. I use the emerging rule threats and, and I run with the C option, um, the PCAP and against the config file and immediately it, it parses out things that says suspicious traffic and it gives you a point to look at. So if you are overwhelmed when you get back to your day job and you see that there's just too much data in this, you don't know where to start. These are different tools that you can have in your tool belt to run the PCAPs against to help you identify now where to look into a little bit deeper. This screenshot here, if it says there's a suspicious post to a dotted quad address with a fake browser, it doesn't mean it's evil. It doesn't mean it's, it's bad, but it's something to look at. And I would go back to my Wireshark, look at the time and date and start looking at traffic at that date and time. But that gives you a starting point. So let's take a look now at some Wireshark uh, filters. We already talked about capture filters. And with capture filters, um, that is specifying what will be logged in the PCAP file that we're capturing. So you may want to filter that down. You may want to have no capture filters and capture everything. It really depends on your use case. Um, as I mentioned, there was certain cases where I might just say, I'm only interested in unencrypted traffic, only capture that. Other cases, I may say, no, I want everything because I don't know what I'm looking for yet. I'm threat hunting. And in those cases, I'm going to use a display filter to take the 10,000 packets I have, narrow that down to a more manageable view. Um, so I just want to show you again and reemphasize this because you'll run into this, and I do it very frequently, that you get used to the Berkeley packet filter 
um, syntax and you type something like host 10.1.1.1 and then you get in your PCAP and you want to filter by that IP address and you type host 10.1.1.1 and it tells you, nope, that's not correct. And you say, I know it is, I've done this before. Well, you were trying to use the capture filter syntax and the display filter syntax. So I just wanted to compare a couple examples there. On the left, you've got the capture filter and what that looks like in Berkeley packet filter syntax. And on the right-hand side, once you already have all the, the traffic and you're narrowing in, you're using a different syntax. Um, I don't memorize all of these. There's two options I'll show you to help you. One is I frequently will Google it and look at the Wireshark website. They do a great job documenting it. And then Wireshark also has an expression builder, which lets you build out the filters for you. So you don't, you kind of click, click, click instead of memorize these filters. So again, capture filters are when you're, before you start capturing, you're defining what you want to log and what you don't want to log. Um, the display filters, I've used that a couple of times in the labs there. It helps you narrow down, identify key packets. Um, Wireshark, you'll get to love and hate this feature, but it will display red. If you're wrong, it's kind of like a guessing game. So you can see there when I did tcp.port equals 80, that's incorrect. I need two equal signs. It turns green when I'm correct. So it's kind of like a game if it's red or green, um, but also you begin to hate the red color when you constantly type the syntax wrong. Um, if you want to build it yourself, right up to the right side of the display filter area where you can type out your text, you can click the expressions dot 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 um, button and that lets you build it out. So you can then um, go ahead and pick fields like TCP flag. So you don't have to know what that is. And then you've got operators like equal, greater than, in packet, less than, equals to, contains, matches, all the different operators, and then a value. So you might say like TCP sin flag equals one or zero, and it helps you build out the syntax. And once you collect some of these things, it then shows you in the bottom there that, oh, the filter that you wanted, that you built was tcp.flags equal equal one. So you didn't have to play that guessing game of red light, green light to see if your syntax was right or wrong. Instead, it builds the filter out for you. So I don't find this incredibly useful in most cases because you can see there's a lot of options and I don't always know that it's tcp.flags. I might think it's tcp space flags. So my go-to is to Google it and look at the, the wireshark.org um, knowledge base articles. But occasionally I'll come into the expression builder and it's nice to know that it's there. Um, someone in the chat did mention that sometimes the bar, instead of green or red, it's olive, like a yellow color. Absolutely correct. And from memory, if it is yellow, I think it means it works, but it's a legacy or deprecated command. So I think they're kind of warning you that you shouldn't be using that, um, but sometimes that still works. Okay, so um, the other way, and probably the most frequent way that I use that, if I'm not using Wireshark.org to look at my display filters, is that I will look for a packet. Like, let's say I'm looking for the source IP coming from 18.236.57.250, and I want to apply a filter only looking for packets from that IP address. Well, I have the option to use the expression builder. I have the option to go out there and Google it. But the easier way is I can just go to a, any packet and look in the, I, the Internet Protocol version 4 section of the details pane, go to source, right click, apply as filter, and um, click selected. One little tip there is a lot of times instead of apply as filter, I like prepare as filter. And the difference is that if you apply as filter, once you click that, it'll populate that in the display filter and press the enter key essentially for you. So it automatically filters. But let's say that I was interested in creating a filter for source IP address of 18.10.10.10, and that's different than the packet I see, I don't wanna to have to go find that packet. So what I would do is I would click on the details pane, internet protocol version four, see the source, right click on it, and do prepare as filter. So it's going to put that syntax up in the display filter, but it's not going to press the enter key. That gives me the opportunity to then change the IP address to what I want instead of 18.236.57.250, enter 18.10.10.10 and then press enter myself and then get exactly what I'm looking for. So um, probably more frequently than anything, I come in there, I do apply as filter or prepare as filter and build my syntaxes that way. It's, it's a quick, easy way to get what you're looking for. Um, so there's a couple of filters that you could take a look at, just some examples. I'm gonna skip over this stuff um, so we can get to the, the meat since we're running out of time here. Um, one more piece thing until we get into some of the labs here is the Wireshark statistics. The Wireshark statistics is another great place to start. It, it kind of gives you an overview, a 30,000 view of 
what's in your PCAPs and you can then narrow in on stuff. So for example, if I have 20,000 packets, I don't know which profile to start with. Should I look at HTTP, HTTPS? Should I look at RDP? What should I start looking at? And so if I don't know, you start getting the hang of it. If you look on the right-hand side of Wireshark, it gives a bar with different colors and you start seeing, okay, green is TCP or HTTP. Um, purple is SSL, TLS traffic. So you can start you know, doing that. But I, I think a better way, a more scientific way is going to statistics and start getting data that way, like protocol hierarchy. So I can look at protocol hierarchy and see, wait a second, 30% of my traffic is RDP and we don't allow RDP in my environment that's evil or that's potentially evil or that's potentially misuse of a protocol, let me dig into that. And now I'm gonna to go to my RDP profile and dig in further. So it gives you a high level view of what's in your, in your traffic, who are the top talkers, right? If I've got a, a large network and I see a Windows 10 endpoint of a salesperson and they account for 40% of my overall traffic of 1200 users, that's a little suspicious. So I can start looking at statistical data here. Um, so we can click on the statistics and we can look at all kinds of other information, you know, information about who captured the packets, protocols. This is a place the labs I recommend you start. And we could see things like, oh, there's tons of HTTP traffic or SMB traffic. And then you start narrowing down based off that. Who are our top talkers? Why are these two systems talking? I'd imagine a domain controller or file server sell a lot of traffic, but why is my salesperson accounting for most of the traffic in my environment? Um, you know, conversations between two people. And you can look at both the layer two, layer three, et cetera, different layers of the OSI model for different things. Like, well, what about protocols? What about IPs? What about MAC addresses? And you can really dive into this stuff. So um, this gets us into the baseline. This is where we really start to get hands-on with some of the labs. I wanna preface this with um, uh, Sun Tzu, the art of war. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. And so I think this applies and I use it in almost every security talk I do because I think most environments, we get out of hand of what normal is and we have a hard time finding evil. Um, recently, I just did a case where we had a client with about 1200 endpoints and uh, we started seeing a domain controller, the administrator account uh, and the logs was getting locked out very frequently. Um, we started digging into it further and we could see that there was a lot of RDP traffic in their environment. And I said, I think it's RDP based off of the logs that someone is um, using tools and doing it over 3389 RDP to brute force your administrator account on your domain. Um, I look at the Palo Alto logs that they had in their SIM and I identify that basically everyone's doing RDP in their environment and it's a flat network. And in that scenario, it took me an extra day and a half to do the incident because I had no idea. I couldn't just look at RDP and say, well, this doesn't make sense. Why is a salesperson doing RDP, right? Or I could understand it if it's your, your IT people and they're in their own subnet, but if everything is just all over the place and you don't know yourself and you don't know what avenues the bad guys are doing to um, compromise you, I don't understand how you're ever gonna win a battle there. So it's really important to understand what normal is, not just in your environment, but protocols themselves. So having that good architecture will help you out a long way, but also knowing protocols, little things like the TTLs of each operating system. You can identify what operating system is just by looking at the TTL in a packet. Um, this brings us into an example here and I'll, I'll hammer home the point of knowing what normal looks like, not just again in your environment, but a protocol itself. Opening up 10,000 packets is overwhelming, I get it. But if you start understanding what normal traffic looks like and you're in luck, the common traffic directory, I give you a bunch of common traffic so you can have that as a baseline in case you run into an incident, you say, I think this is evil. Let me go back and look at what Mike provided and see what that baseline traffic looks like. So here's an example of, um, I basically took a command prompt in Windows and I pinged an address, a, a domain, and it was offline. And we can see that there's four requests, but there's no response back. This is normal traffic. Now let's take a look at what happens when I turn the server back on. I do four requests, but each between each request, we receive apply. So it's request, reply, request, reply four times. That's a Windows system. That's normal behavior. That's a baseline. We also take a look at the length column. We can see that all of my echoes and uh, or my requests and my echo replies are all 64 bytes in size. Okay. And we can kind of look at that and what normal traffic looks like. Now, um, I am going to... Uh, skip ahead a little bit here. These are some of the common um, PCAPs I give you, but I want to go ahead and skip um, for the sake of time over this IOC section, and I want to show you how that comes in handy. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at 
a scenario here. You've got a network admin, Betty, interrupts you as you're reading Peter Kim's Hacker Playbook 3. Uh, you just uh, were getting to the part about new pen testing lab setup. Yes, Betty, you ask? With an annoyed tone, I was working with Palo Alto support this weekend and upload and updating our firewall rules. And I noticed uh, something unusual in the PCAP. Can you take a look? Unfortunately, Betty's laptop had a blue screen of death uh, when you got back to her desktop. Um, so the PCAP was corrupt. However, she did have a screenshot saved that PCAP. Um, so you put down your book and you take a look at that screenshot. So now that we, we looked at the baseline of what ICMP pings look like in a normal environment. I want you to take a look at the screenshot and in Slack channel, go ahead and comment on things that are abnormal. So we've identified normal, now what's abnormal? So point out a few things that you see in this screenshot and let me know in Slack. Okay, one person said TTL, right? So we saw that um, a TTL was a little bit different. We see it's 255 here, what else? Okay, size of packets, we saw with our baseline that it was 74 bytes for both the send and the receive. And now we can see it's variant length. 704 bytes, 82 bytes, 302 bytes, 82 bytes, it's all over the place. Out of sequence, someone else mentioned, absolutely, the sequences aren't matching up. Uh, multiple replies for requests, right? So it's not request, reply, request, reply. Um, several requests, right? So we saw with Windows baseline is four. Obviously you can change that and make it more or less. Um, but this doesn't look like a typical Windows, you know, four pings and four responses. Okay, and then someone said there the current packet is a GET request. So this one takes a while for people, but go ahead and look down in the bytes pane. So look at the bottom of the screen there. Do we see anything else? This is ICMP traffic. It's, it's request, reply, request, reply. It's basically, you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. So someone pointed out there in the Slack channel that if you look at the bytes inside of packet number 11769 up at the top there. If we look at the bytes, there is an HTTP get request and there's a domain name there and there. That does not make sense for an ICP packet. This is absolutely abnormal. And I can tell you it's, it's ICMP tunneling. It's exfiltrating data um, over ICMP. So a normal person looking at this and we can see that Wireshark took the protocol and the dissector says it's ICMP. It's not, it's tunneling through ICMP, which is important to actually look at more detail than just what the dissector is telling you, right? So, and then the host looks unusual. So we can dig a little bit deeper, but I wanted to use this as an illustration that once we looked at normal, if I didn't show you the, um, what a normal ICMP request reply looks like, maybe a couple of you would have got the, the abnormal things, the anomalous activity here, but I don't know if all of you would, but I think by looking at what normal traffic looks like, now you can identify some of the suspicious stuff. So let's take a look at one of the labs here. Um, so this is a lab that you can open up. It's a netcat file exfil. It's very simple to start with. So I'm gonna walk through the scenario and then I want you to open it up yourself and take a look at it. The scenario is as you're walking to the break room to get more cold brew coffee, um, you bump into George who says he's been meaning to call you all day about a possible incident, but he's been swamped with TPS reports. After his lunch break, he noticed that a sensitive document was opened in notepad um, and he sure it wasn't looking at that document before he left. There was also a black window open in the background saying something about North Carolina. Can you look at it, George asks. Okay, so we wanna collect some information with this incident. Before you open it, I wanna show you what happened because I think it's important to see the, the evil and then you look at the packets then we can identify that a little bit more. So what I did in the left here is I've got the victim and I opened up the command prompts and I used netcat.exe and I connected to an IP address, which happens to be an Amazon um, instance I spun up, uh, 52.33.20.94 on port 80. And I basically um, pushed in a text file called test.txt, which said, this is a test file or text file with sensitive data. So I pushed that through port 80 to that IP address that I have listening in Amazon Web Services, it happens to be in the Oregon region. And in the bottom right there, we have the attacker's computer. So that's the um, Ubuntu system I have listening in AWS. And it's listening on port 80 for any data that comes in and it reads, it writes that to a file. So it writes it to out file. And we could see this is a text file with sensitive data. So essentially I took a text file from the end user and shoved it through port 80 to my AWS system. And that text file was there. That's definitely not HTTP traffic traditionally. So what I want you to do is go ahead and you can open up um, I'm going to go back just so I can see what it was called. It's netcat-xfil.pcapng. And if you open that up, you should see this. And so I'm going to switch screens here into my um, Kelly box, if I can find my mouse. So in, if we can all see my 
Kelly box here. I'm going to go back to the Wireshark um, PCAPs, lab files, and inside here I should have netcat xfil directory, and then there's netcat xfil pcap ng. If we open that up, I can see that there's, it's really small, it's just eight packets, and that's because I exported just the stuff I wanted you to focus on. Um, so we can even see the start of the conversations are really weird. We see a, a local address 192.168.10.10, .10, um, 10.100, sorry, and it's going to a public IP address. Um, I'm going to switch the profile to, to uh, let's do IR workshop here. So we can see that it's starting an ephemeral port and it's going to port 80. This looks normal, but if we look at the info there, this doesn't look like a normal handshake. It's syn, enc, CWR, and then I've got a synac, and then an ACK, and then a push, and so it's a little bit strange. Um, I can right click on one of these packets and I can do a follow TCP stream since it's TCP traffic. And that basically takes all these packets and puts it together and shows me all the ASCII from the, the client and the server in that conversation. So this shows me all that, it compiles it. You could easily look at one packet at a time and look through the TCP and try and look down here at the bytes and, and do that. But I find it easier if I just follow TCP stream and I get all that. So I can see that this is a text, uh, text file with sensitive data. That's all the conversation was. There was nothing else. This doesn't look like normal web traffic where we see a get or a post or user agent strings. None of that normal stuff is there. And we can see even Wireshark had a little bit of a hard time dissecting that information. It's like, wait a second, it is port 80, but I can't, I don't know how to dissect that. I don't see the normal headers of HTTP traffic. So um, it was a little bit confused there. So if you take a look at that, um, you can look at that lab. I do wanna um, move into some other ones here and uh, go back to my slides just so we can have some fun with um, um, some of the more advanced labs. So let's go back to my slides. Okay, so now we've got a reverse shell. So I'm taking the netcat tool again. In this case, we've got Sally who calls security team on Monday morning to report a possible incident. She said uh, she locked her computer on Friday before leaving the office. When she got in Monday morning, her computer was unlocked and there was a black screen with, with um, uh, white writing about cats. So this is gonna be the netcat reverse shell PCAP NG. Um, there's a question about the password to extract the PCAPs. It's infected all lowercase. Okay, and so if I go here, we try and answer some of these questions. I again wanna show you what the attack looked like and then we can switch over to the lab and take a look at that. You could follow along. <clears throat> the, on the top here, we've got the victim machine. So again, it was ncat.exe. It's going to that same IP address on port 80, but instead of a file this time, we have the dash E, which is basically passing through cmd.exe to the attacker. So on the attacker box in the bottom right there, we've got um, sudo nc, which is netcat, um, basically listen on port 80 and be verbose. And then it's listening on port 80 for anyone who communicates on that socket. And once there's communication there, it's basically has access to cmd.exe. So this gives the attacker um, remote command line um, executable options on the victim machine once this is executed. So on this next slide, this is the attacker. Once they've established this reverse shell, coming back to the attacker, we can see that I've got um, a command prompt there of Windows, right? This is obviously a Linux system, but I see C users, username, downloads, and there's a prompt. I type, who am I? Red flag right there. And we see that I'm running as the corporate blue user. I then type net user. We can see which um, um, users are on the system. I see there's an administrator, corporate blue, guest. I do a dir to see what's in the directory. I can see files in the directory. So this is basically enumeration. These are steps that an attacker would do once they have a reverse shell. Um, now let's look at that, that PCAP on the screen, is if we open up that PCAP file there, we can see there's a lot more packets, not a ton, but still a bit more, again on port 80, and if we follow that TCP stream, we're gonna go ahead and see all those commands. So I'll quickly switch back to my Kelly box, show you that, and then we'll go on to a lab that you can do a little bit more hands-on with. Um, where is my Kelly box? There it is. Okay, so I'm gonna close this, go back to my labs. I'm gonna look for a netcat reverse shell, open this up. Okay, so I've got a bit more, there's 51 packets now, but similarly, if we look at this in my IR workshop profile, I can see that, I, again, I've got some weird packets here. It's port 80, but I don't see it dissected as HTTP traffic. Um, I can follow by right-clicking, follow TCP stream. 
and I can see now red again is the client machine and blue is going to be the destination or the server essentially or the attacker. So we can see it's passing over a Windows command prompt, cmd.exe. The attacker types in blue, who am I? Um, <clears throat> then it provides another prompt, the attacker types net user. This is all what we saw on the previous slide where I was enumerating. Right, all this stuff we can see through this um, packet capture. Okay, and then obviously you could switch through profiles if you'd like. I'm gonna go back through and then the next lab is where I'm gonna give you a little time to play with that. Um, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. You should be able to see my slides again. We're gonna look at the lab for patch Tuesday. So the scenario that we have here is that your system admin reports a potential incident after performing remote updates on an EC2 instance. Take a look at the sniff traffic to determine if there is a session um, to dig a deeper into. So this is going to be hta dot um, slash sorry hta dash empire dot um, pcap ng. So on this one though, I'm going to give you a few seconds to go through it. I'm going to switch over to my my Kali box, but essentially what you're trying to look for is a timeline, who is involved, a little summary of what happened, date, time, um, any indications of of malicious use in this network traffic. Um, so I'm going to switch over here to Kali again. I'm going to close this. I'm just going to open up the, the PCAP and then I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to go through this and then type things into Slack of what you're seeing. So this is the Patch Tuesday. Okay, and so we've got 3,000 packets now, so it's a little bit bigger. Um, and we can see some other traffic here. So what I want you to do is um, take a look at that you know, post things in the Slack of anything that stands out, that makes the, the hair on the back of your neck stand out, switch through the different profiles we've created, maybe go into the statistics and look at, um, for example, the, the endpoints, the hierarchy, kind of give me some information as, as a first responder there and pretend I'm a, a manager and executive and I want to know some basic information about what happened here. So I'll give you maybe two or three minutes to look through that. Go ahead and keep posting in Slack about anything you find that, that just doesn't feel right to you. Okay, a couple good things I see in, in Slack here. Um, we see some uh, get to an admin directory, a get to a, I'm sorry, a post to a login.php uh, pro or process.php. Someone said something about an HTA file, a PowerShell script. Someone else says uh, they're seeing traffic to and from Ireland. Um, if this is a small mom and pop shop that doesn't do any work in Ireland and they're a brick and mortar store, does this make sense? Okay, so this is the attack, what happened. So for those of you who haven't seen reverse shells and stuff, I used a tool called Empire, um, kind of like Metasploit if you're familiar with that. It's a uh, exploitation framework. The cool thing about Empire is that it's fileless. It, it likes to do stuff in PowerShell. So the payloads are not binaries that you're, you're downloading, but it's actually in PowerShell, which is fileless. And um, Windows does not log PowerShell. So that's cool for the attackers because the malicious activity doesn't get logged. Um, it's most of the time the malicious activity is in memory. So you're not going to see that file sitting on the desktop and all the different droppers and everything. It's going to be uh, memory. So as soon as you pull the plug, like most people do when they're scared about a malware, um, all that goes away unless you're capturing memory. Um, and the other cool thing is that um, there's so many ways to obfuscate through PowerShell. If you try and look for um, malicious modules, you can um, do arrays, you can truncate it, you can do uh, capital, lowercase. So doing regex and trying to um, identify or alert on malicious PowerShell use is extremely difficult. There's a couple of YouTube videos out there that kind of show you how bad that is for, for defenders. So basically I created um, a Empire uh, listener um, I created a file called Adobe Update.hta. Um, I then placed that on the internet and the, set up a listener. So it's basically listening for anyone that connects on a port. So if anyone uses that Adobe Update.hta file, which most browsers are fine with, um, it creates a reverse shell back to the system. Um, so I got my listener set up there. I got a successful connection. We can see that there was a admin PowerShell payload that was successful. Um, and then it, I had full control of the system. I could, you know, copy files, I could exfiltrate data. I'm in their environment at that point. So if you first, if you go to Wireshark and you look at the file export objects, you could see it there. You could see the Adobe dash update, um, dot HTA that was downloaded. That's something I look at. We can also see all those PHP page, pages. Um, for any of you defenders, um, Empire does that. It takes a look at uh, it creates random pages to try and make it look normal. 
like process news. So that's basically it responding back over PHP and it's trying to hide it with different PHP names. It's, it's all the same thing. It's part of my reverse shell. Um, if we actually look at, if we extract that Adobe update.hta file, it's, it's pretty cool because if we run strings against it and we do further malware analysis, we could see that that pretty much looks like obfuscated PowerShell. PowerShell. If we then run base64 decode against the, the HTA file, this is what we get. And we can see that it is using spaces. So it's trying to evade as well, but we can see that PowerShell is being used inside there. So um, some pretty malicious stuff. Anytime you see base64, you shouldn't normally see that in most environments. So that's a major, major red flag. And I can see other things like get file and, and stuff there that's generally used with malicious stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and I'll give you a little bit of time here. It's probably one of the, the last ones we have time for unless Martin lets us go a little bit further. Um, but I wanna take a look at the CPA threat hunting one. Um, this is a, a little scenario I'll give you. You just got a job at Wiley Wiley Co LP and leading edge CPA from in Los Angeles, California. As a junior threat hunter, you place a switch port into span, tapping traffic between tax preparation software sitting on application server and any client communication looking for indicators of compromise. Wireshark captures get split into two files due to the amount of traffic collected. So now you've got two files to look at, CPA firm threat hunting P1 and P2. Um, this one, a little backstory, while I give you a few minutes to take a look at this one. Um, this is the lab environment, but this is how I found four zero day vulnerabilities in major tax software. Um, I just recreated it in a lab since obviously I wasn't gonna give you the client um, information. And uh, if you want more information on the exact vulnerabilities, you can go to themikewiley.com. Um, I've got a breakdown of how I found this and some of the other vulnerabilities, but I'm actually giving you this and you can see that if any of you use a CPA and they're using one of two software that, that had these major vulnerabilities and one of them still has it, um, even though I reported it years ago at B-Sides Vegas, um, you can see that all your tax information is just being flooded across the CPA's network and clear tax. So I'm going to let you find that. Um, so I want you to go into the CPA threat hunting P1 and P2 look around there, use some of the techniques we talked about, um, pay attention to the type of traffic you're seeing. Um, you may wanna look at some of the profiles that I provided you in the downloads and add those profiles to your, uh, your system because there's some traffic we haven't looked at yet and some of those profiles will help you out. Um, but a great place to start again is looking at the statistics, looking at the protocol hierarchy and seeing what kind of traffic you're seeing and then you could start diving in, follow TCP streams. It's all local traffic, so you're not gonna be looking as much for uh, external traffic in this one. So I'll give you a few minutes here and um, post anything inside the Slack channel if you see that. Awesome job, Jeff. It looks like um, you have identified um, some complete tax reports and that's absolutely correct. Um, one thing that identified looking at some of these tax software was that um, when a CPA logs in, so it's a client server relationship, if you haven't seen that already, and you install the tax software on the server and you share out over SMB the database and then you install the um, tax software on all your CPA's computers and your, even your, your main admins. And you then point it at that database over an SMB share. And once the, the CPA authenticates with a username and password, what happens is that they, um, it requests from the server, hey, I'm, I'm a valid user. You see my username and password that says, yep, you are here's a copy of the entire tax database of all our customers and all of their tax information. Um, some of the, the ones we found, they didn't actually do all the tax information. It was just all the customers. And when I say customers, it was their name, social security number of both spouses, their home address, phone number, email address. Um, and you'll see some sample data I put in there, like one, 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 you know, all ones, and then all twos, those are social security numbers. Um, and then you see their phone number, email address, occupation, stuff like that. So most of them, uh, you know, if you had 3,000 customers or, or clients as a CPA firm, all of those are traversing your network every time you log into the data, uh, into the tax application. And then um, it was also, um, once you go into a client, like let's say Michael Wiley, and you go into my tax return to enter data, every time that you open the client file, it sent their entire tax data from, you know, many years ago to present. And then every time you send an update, it sent your tax returns basically back to the server. So all your tax information, your social, all your numbers, your income, your expenses, everything you file on tax terms going back and forth like ping pong between the client and the server. So it's, it's kind of interesting to take a look at that stuff. 
Did anyone find the name of the file um, hosting basically all the client information? The database file. Someone says um, uh, data looks like one something 17. I think that's correct. So this was um, the software was Intuit Lacert. Um, and it's the different data files, and then it has the tax year. So depending on which version of Lacert tax software you had, in this case, it was 2017, um, it had a DBF file. And so one other way um, to take a look at this is looking at the statistics. You can look at the protocol hierarchy. We can see it's a lot of SMB traffic here. So once I do that, I go back to my profiles and say, wait a second, I don't have a profile for that. I could build one, but the other thing that I can do here too is, if we go to um, about folders and I go to the personal configuration here, my profiles, one other thing you can do is take the, the data I gave you, those pre-built profiles. So I can extract, I've got one for SMB here. I'll extract it. I'm gonna take this and drop it into my profiles. So now I have an SMB profile. Most of the time, Wireshark picks it up quickly. So let's see if I have to restart. Now I have an SMB profile. And look at that. It gives me things like SMB read length, some times, um, some of the streams. And this could be some more valuable information. I don't think it has file name. That's one that, oh, it does have file name. So this is where you could have just essentially sorted by file name. I've lost my bearings with all these columns. So now I can see all these file names and start looking through these and follow these or look at what these files have. But we see some test data. Here's some other ones. We see the, the data 17.dbf. I can look at these. It's in an iData directory. So you can see how, um, and then some of these different, I think these are some of the users that it was pulling from. There's some config files, but you could see how these profiles are helping us based off of the type of traffic we have identified. Anyone else have any comments on this one before we, we move on? Oh, it's a good point. So Andy says doing an export object, SMB, you get a similar looking list. So that's another way that you can look at those files as well. And so we could see there's some other language here in Spanish. We can kind of just parse through this, this file or we could have extracted it and used tools like strings. Um, but we can see all kinds of stuff here like mailing envelopes from clients, um, some of the format of things here. And if you scroll all the way down like this right here, this is an actual um, tax return. So sales the client that I used here, and these are some of the sample numbers I used about their income from W2 and stuff like that, um, sample client. And then if we keep going down, it's kind of hard to find exactly what I want. If you find it just right, you will see like the list of clients in here and it might be in the part one um, folder. I think that's where the, the first transaction happened, but you could parse through this. And then I think in one of the walkthroughs, or if you look at my uh, website, the mikewiley.com, you can look at some of the, the CVEs I have there and it actually shows you the same data. So you can map it back to what you found and see what was entered in the actual tax software and, and see how that comes across over the network. So that's kind of a fun one. Uh, I see someone else typing. I'm going to switch back over to my slides and we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so a few people leave off. You need to take off. Obviously, you've got the slides. I'm going to put one more up here just to show a little bit more of a, one showing ingress and egress traffic. And then I'll probably be calling it a night here as well. Um, so I even walk through it and I show you some of the stuff in the slides. You can go through that. You could obviously use strings or other tools to look for things like username, passwords. Um, here's a screenshot of the, what I was looking for on my screen, but it's the full client list and you could see different users there, their fake addresses and stuff like that. Um, let me see if there's, I think one of the fun ones here, if we look at, so there's some ransomware, you could see one cry, but I want to move on to network tools download. I think this is kind of a fun one here. Um, so the scenario is that you're, you've got Snort IDS in line and it alerts on a potential malicious executable being downloaded by a network admin. 
Uh, the network admin is on break, so you must dig into captured uh, network traffic to determine if the download is evil or a false alarm, essentially a false positive. So I want you to dig through that. Uh, I will warn you, there's a little bit of some graphical or graphic language inside the um, PCAP. I apologize about that, but it is a legitimate piece of malware and I didn't write the malware, they wrote it. So apologize if you get offended about that piece, but it is um, legitimate malware. And I want you to find out where it came from. I want you to look at some of the evil in there and some indi other indications that you find. So this is gonna be the network tools download. It's gonna be the lab download network tools PCAP NG. Um, so take a look at that post in Slack. If you see anything, things that stand out, uh, and then we'll take a look at, we'll do a walkthrough on that one. And we'll probably wrap up after that. So again, places to start, if you're not sure protocol hierarchy would be one of those. Um, once you identify protocols, switch between the different profiles. If it's HTTP, HTTPS, SMB, whatever the traffic is, um, search for those things or identify the profile and then look at the different columns we've created in prior labs to see if you see anything funky. Okay, someone says HTTP object list shows um, security credentials, plain text file. Let me take a look at that. So I think this, the, the security credentials, um, it has to do something with AWS. Um, I, frequently when I run lab environments there, you get some unusual traffic from AWS. So um, it does look like it's passing certain things. We're not passing certain things, but it is some kind of check for credentials. I've seen that a lot of my AWS labs. I haven't seen any actual credentials in there, um, but maybe someone else has some other thoughts on that. Okay, I see someone else says that there's a text file that they found there uh, that's related to Emutet. Um, that's probably a, a pretty good red flag. Um, and as I mentioned, this, is, this was a legitimate piece of malware that was pretty popular. So you can see that it's not always super stealth. They're calling it Emutet. Um, so if I go over here and do file um, object HTTP and we look at the Emutet, there's two of them. I'm gonna minimize this and follow the stream. Okay, that's a little concerning, right? So there's the Emutet text file that was a get request from, from a host. And then the, the server response there, it's, a, it's some type of Apache system. And if we look down, it's plain text file, but in that plain text file, does they wouldn't know what this is, function invoke, and some of the other things here. What do you think this is? I see another thing here, switch, a dollar sign, do not zero MZ, right? So someone says PowerShell, absolutely PowerShell, but do not um, zero MZ. This is a technique malware authors use all the time, right? Commandlet binding, right? You don't need to know everything that's happening here. Um, I talk about this in, ma in malware analysis is that it's like learning a second language, right? Um, I'm, I, I've been trying to learn Spanish for, for the last probably 15 years and I still can't. And so one of the things that I do though, is I pick up a keyword and that's the, the main thing is you don't have to know everything that's going on, have a full conversation. You just need to know how to get Cerveza and use the banual. So remote script blocking, that doesn't look good, right? I'm looking for just keywords, Win32 stuff, some function calls, um, keep scrolling down here. I think I saw some URLs being passed, but a lot of stuff that's happening here over a text file, which is definitely um, not so good. New commandlet pointers. And then down here towards the bottom, this is also pretty interesting too, because if we look, I see now dollar sign computer name equals null or computer name is match. It looks like it might be doing some um, information like proc name, computer name, invoke command, script block. It's probably trying to gather information we see PE bytes 32. And now what does this look like? Anyone? Gobbledygook, what does that resemble? Base 64, probably. Um, I've had troubles with this and I think it's because some of these slashes. In the past, I have decoded this and it was pretty interesting to see what they were doing, um, but absolutely. And again, without even seeing this at the bottom, I see the equal equal for padding down here. Um, so base 64 encoded, we also see convert from base 64 string down here at the bottom. So we definitely know, um, you know, those of you who are, are more veteran, you can analyze this, but 
Um, I have done it in prior classes that were longer and it was pretty interesting to see some of the base 64 encoded stuff that they were doing as well. Um, any other comments or observations about this before we wrap up here? Does anyone know what the original file was? putty.exe, exactly. And so this was a, a piece of malware that was um, embedded. It was Imutet that got embedded in putty.exe. And there was a whole thing on security news sites that um, people were downloading what they thought was legitimate putty.exe and it was actually still in credentials. So if you do decode that base 64 as maybe a take home challenge, um, there's a lot of stuff about credential theft and they were basically trying to steal your SSH keys. It was, it was quite an interesting piece. Um, so it was putty.exe and then within putty.exe there's um, PowerShell and all kinds of evil stuff that's going on to capture SSH keys and credentials. Um, but a lot of people got infected by that piece of malware. So I wish I could find the original binary. I can't find it anymore, but it was a very, it was definitely an interesting one to, to analyze uh, way back when. And I've been looking for it since then and I can't find it. So if anyone else does, let me know. Um, that's a fun one I'd like to add to some of my other classes. Um, but that is, unless anyone else has any other observations, that's kind of the key. Um, I did get the, I think if you look at some of this stuff here in the PCAP, I did download the putty.exe from GitHub at one point. So you could see the source of where that was downloaded. It is HTTPS, but at least you could see through the server name, if you switched your profiles that it was github.com. Um, and it was, I think inside the U S as well. So just something interesting to poke at, look at when you're, um, back at home and away from this workshop. Um, if there's no other questions in the chat, I'll probably be around for a few more minutes, but I'll, I'll open it up to, um, I'm going to actually switch back to my PowerPoint, put the, my contact info back up there, but switch it back to Martin and see if he has, um, anything else he wants to finish with or close with and, um, definitely around if there's any questions after that. What a workshop, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I think people really enjoyed it. I got um, quite a few private messages um, thanking us for, for hosting this and you in particular for giving the presentation, obviously. Um, also, a lot of people up to 50 stayed until just a minute or two ago. So that means they were, it was, it was a good workshop, very entertaining. Well, I had fun. Uh, Thank you for, for having me. Yeah, anytime, Mike. Um, Stick around in the Santa Barbara channel if you have more questions once uh, we wrap up this workshop. Um, some people will be there, I'll be there. Mike uh, may come in and out in the next few days as well um, to answer some questions. And you can follow Mike at the, the Mike Wiley on Twitter. And that's it, thank you everyone for joining and we really hope to see you next time.